welcome to Ariel Helwani's MMA Show! Back in your life on this Monday, December 9, 2019. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. Welcome back to the program. And boy, oh boy, do we have a super stack show for all of you. An old school show, if you will. It has been a long time since we had 12. Yes, I said 12 guests on this program. Some of the biggest names in the sport. The newsmakers. People who had big weekends. People who expect to have big weekends coming up. We got a lot to discuss with a lot of different and interesting people were coming off the ufc's return after the two-week hiatus they were in washington dc this past saturday great event in honor of the late great Stuart scott and what about that main event jarzinho rosenstrike ends the year four and oh it has been a long time since we've seen a heavyweight burst onto the scene like this knocks out alistair Overeem with just four seconds remaining in the fifth round splits his lip open unbelievable then calls out francis and Gano once again we got a lot to discuss as far as the Surinamese fighter is concerned. We also have to discuss UFC 245, maybe a little Anthony Joshua talk, and to maybe educate all the casuals out there who had no idea what they were watching. We got a lot going on. Plus the road show for contestants this Friday, December 13th, at the Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club at the Link Promenade, right across from Caesars. Tickets on sale right now. We got a lot going on. All right, let me run down today's lineup, and then we will get to our first guest of the day because we have no time to dilly-dally off the top of today's program because, like I said, 12 guests. Yes, I said 12 guests, live and in living color. At 4 o'clock, we're going to be joined by Aspen Ladd. What a performance by Aspen Ladd. Coming off the loss in January, excuse me, July, to Jermaine Durandamy. Remember, she had the weight problems. People were wondering, should she move up to 145? I was wondering. If she should move up to 145. She comes back on Saturday against Yana Kunitskaya. Looks very good and had that great moment in between the second and third round. Her coach is firing her up. Then she comes out and she finishes the fight seconds later. How about Alex Volkanovsky? Alexander the Great. He meets Max Holloway this Saturday for the UFC featherweight title. 245, Las Vegas, co-main event. Huge fight. Finally gets his title fight. He's won 17 in a row. Alexander the Great. I'm looking forward to having him on the program. Also looking forward to having his teammate, Kai Kara France, fighting officially in the United States for the first time this Saturday against Brandon Moreno. He was on Tough 24. This is his first official UFC fight card. Big moment for him. One of the up-and-coming flyweights. Also another product of City Kickboxing. Diego Sanchez is back. Just announced that he had uh, re-signed with the UFC and also is fighting on the February 15th card in Rio Rancho, New Mexico against Michelle Pejeda. Always a pleasure to have Diego Sanchez on the program. He'll be on at around 3.05. Stefan Struve was in the news this past weekend. Lost to Ben Rothel very controversially. Two low blows. Dan Mergliata telling him to continue. What the heck was going on? Came back out of retirement for that. Weird stuff. We'll talk to him at 2.50. We'll also talk to Fran Singanu. Get his thoughts on Jarzinho's win and the call out. Terrence Crawford. Bud Crawford. Yes. One of the pound for pound best boxers on the planet will join us at 2.20. He competes this Saturday at Madison Square Garden. We'll talk to Paul Felder. He's in the news as well. He meets Dan Hooker in uh, Auckland. In February, had that great stare down last week. What about Bryce Mitchell, 150? We'll talk to him about the twister, just the second twister in UFC history. Can you keep up with me here? We got a lot of names joining us on today's show. Bryce Mitchell, Thug Nasty. What about Liz Carmouche? Got released on, on uh, Thursday unceremoniously while doing PR work for the UFC. What's up with that? We'll talk to her at 1.30. And Amanda Nunes, the reigning defending greatest female fighter of all time. She returns on Saturday against Jermaine Durandamy. She'll join us at 1.15. But first, let's talk to the man of the hour, the man of the weekend, the man who extended his UFC record to 4-0 with that great knockout of Alistair Overeem on Saturday night. The pride of Suriname. Jarzinho, Biggie Boy, Rosenstrike. He joins us right now. Jarzinho, my man, congratulations. How are you? Thank you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Wow. Uh, of all the wins thus far in the UFC, that was your fourth, but you had those quick knockouts. Considering who it was against... Oh, who's this man? Thank you, man. I'm meeting a lot of people here on the airport. Just, you know... This is beautiful. Yeah, man, it is. Who is that man? It's a man of Suriname, and he tell me I'm God's child, and people are taking a lot of pictures right now. Yeah, it's crazy. These people are just coming up to you to, to wish you congratulations. Yes. It's okay. Do your thing. I want I want to witness this. 
Yes. And he was gone. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah. So big man like Oferin. Thank no, you, man. you got Appreciate you it. got gonna bless you, man. Thank you. Wow. You help Suriname. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. This yeah. old friend of ours in Suriname, meet my people, man. This is beautiful. Suriname is me. I'm at the airport and I'm going home. So people are embracing uh, me and uh, enjoying hey, my Rosie. my win. Yes. What is that? Suma bed that Suriname for. Life is changing for Zarzinho. Yeah, man, it is. What is it like to have people come I've up to you now in America? Is life on a show? Yes. Have people coming on me a day. It's life on a Skype show. And, uh, yeah. It's the biggest show I know. It's the only other one in there. Yeah. What does that feel like, Zarzinho, to have people come up to you in America and, and hug you like that? Who is next? Nah, man, it feels great. I want to fight this guy in, in Ghana. So we're waiting till we just... <laughs> this yes. guy's doing a better oh, interview yeah. than I am right now. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> nah, a lot of people are here right now. You know? So you're going? are you going home to Suriname right now? <laughs> and I was asking you, the four yeah, wins in the UFC, break. considering who this one was against yeah. and it was a main event, does this one feel more special than the first three? I may have lost uh, Jairzinho. Maybe we... uh, one more time. Your question. I, I I was wondering if because this win was against Alistair Overeem and because it was your first main event in the UFC, you had those other three victories that were very quick knockouts. But did this one feel more special considering who it was against and how the fight played out? I I say we call him on the phone because he's in the airport and maybe the Wi-Fi isn't good. Let's just get. Uh, few thoughts from Jarzino. Jarzino, we're going to call you on the phone right now. Uh, well, then call Lou. What do you want me to say? It's just hard to do an interview when you can't uh, hear the guy. So we'll, we'll get in touch. There's a lot going on in Jarzino's life, so it's all very understandable. Perhaps Lou is with him. Um, no, we do have his number. I've texted you have his number. What do you mean just do the show? You told me you don't have his number, and I have his number. Do you want me to send it to you? Just one second. This is the beauty of live TV here. We're going to just take a deep breath, and here it is, coming your way. I mean, it's very exciting for the guy. Just gets his first main event win, knocks out fellow Dutchman. You know, he's got those Dutch ties, kickboxing ties, Alistair Overeem. And he did it, like I said, with just four seconds remaining in the fifth round. They said on the broadcast that he was down four rounds to none. In fact, one of the judges, I think, gave him the fourth round. But the fact of the matter is he was going to lose that fight in four seconds. And I saw some people who were criticizing Dan Margliotta for the stoppage. I think that I think you could criticize Dan Margliotta for the way in which the Stefan Struve-Ben Rothwell fight went. I don't think you can criticize him for that stoppage. I thought that was a proper stoppage. And I also feel like... Overeem was out. I mean, you could see it. I don't really understand. I know there's four seconds, but you can't base it off of that. Jarzinho is back joining us right now on the phone. Jarzinho, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How okay. You doing, man? No problem. Yeah, the Skype connection was a little uh, difficult there, so we'll do it on the phone. No problem. Um, and so yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you, you answered the question. I was just wondering if that was a little more special to you because it was against Alistair in your first main event than the first three UFC fights. Yeah, it was this one. Was, all the fights were special, but this one was special. Why? I show how other he came in with a perfect game plan, and I was like, yeah, the fighting is uh, his attack, and yeah. As soon as I got this opportunity in the last second of this fight, I put him down, and I saw I, I just hit him with the right fist, and he, he let his guard go. So I go with the left, and I see he just keep going back, and I jump in with the right, and yeah, boom, that was it. Some people, like I was just saying, criticized Dan Mergliata for the stoppage. What did you think of the stoppage? Nah, I saw he was out, and that's why I walk away, because I saw, I saw the damage. So I look at him, and I was going with the right again, but I was, then I saw he would go down, and then I turned my back. I walk away, and the, guy, the referee was running at me. So I, I walk away. It's respect, man. I can keep hitting, hitting him, right. and I see he's out. So, I mean, I give him that respect. I mean, you know... I want to win, I won, and then I walk away. If you wanted me to damage him more, ah, I don't think people want that. Man. Did you recall noticing the lip right away? And what were you thinking when you saw that? I saw, he get, I saw his eye was out. 
you know, I saw him go out and I look at him and I walk away. I saw that you guys, you even embraced afterwards. What Did he say anything to you? Because it seemed like he was handling it very well. You know, he just lost his heartbreaker, four seconds remaining, his lip is hanging, but yet it seemed like he was very gracious in defeat. What did he say to you afterwards? Nah, he was angry, and uh, after I say, hey, thank you, man, I'll see you next time. Okay, so he was and angry. Was just, yeah, he was angry. Okay. What were you thinking going into that fifth round? Did you have a feeling that you were down at least three rounds and that you had to stop him to win that fight? Yeah, man. I mean, I know I was, I know I was down. I was losing that fight. And my coach keep telling me, hey, man, you want to win this fight? No. And then last round, he gave me the kick in the ass. And I was like, yeah. If he flipped, and I was keep pressuring, pressuring. And for me, it feels like the fight was going really fast. You know, the, min the minutes in the fight were going really fast. I didn't, I'm like, hey, before you think the round is over. And I mean, it's five minutes, but it, it seems like, it, it seems like, it seems like it was like uh, 30 seconds. You know? Yeah. I know he's a legend. I know you've been watching him for a while. But in a way, was he was he better than you thought he would be? Did he surprise you with anything? No, he did. Yeah, he surprised me. Uh, I didn't think he was he was going to wrestling right away. Ah. Uh. But I think he was. I think the mistake he made, he tried to 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 shut my left hand down, and then don't see the right. And yeah, to wrestle, it's a good game plan. But you know, it is, I know, I know, I have to teach, I have to my grappling, and you can bring me down. And I always try to get up as soon as I get up. And the next thing I know is the next round start standing up. So, so I know the next round start standing up. So I mean, we're gonna stand up again. So can you hold me there? I keep saying it's a high level fighter. It's a left over name. He did a lot of things for the sport in different different levels, you know, in kickboxing and in MMA. So I need I know I need to show really good heart there. And I mean I did. How did it you is feel? over till it's over. Absolutely. You you proved that on, on uh, Saturday. How did you feel? First time in your career that you go into the fourth or fifth round, cardio wise, how did you feel out there? I feel great. I was tired and yeah, I was able to go more. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I got him a few times in the fight, but I couldn't finish it. And I was keep searching for those moments. And yeah. So after, once again, like you told us a couple of weeks ago, you want Francis Ngannou. He even responded to you on Twitter. He's going to be on the show later. How confident are you that you are going to get Francis Ngannou next? Nah, I'm happy and I'm excited for that fight. So, uh, I mean, when I head to the gym, make sure I'm ready and I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, you responded and I can't wait till we get this fight done. Do you think that's a number one contender fight? If you beat Nganu, do you think your next fight after that is for the belt? Yeah, it, it's possible to be, but for me, it doesn't matter. I want to fight him. And, I mean, hey, I don't know. Hey, Lou just coming in. How you doing, Lou? Yeah. <laughs> the great Lou De Bono. Uh, yeah. If he, uh, what was the question again? Uh, if, if you think that a win over Ngannou gets you a title shot, yeah, that would probably be good. Yeah. Well, that the right way. I mean, we're here for the heavyweight. We're here fighting for the baddest man on the planet. And if I got a uh, chance to fight uh, for the title, I do it right away. He's he's very anxious to get back in there. He wants to get in there soon. How soon do you want to return? Realistically, I want to oh, out March April. Okay. If I get to fight like eight March, uh, beginning of April, I uh, yeah, I fight against him. Okay, and now so now you're going back home to Suriname. You're you're at the airport right now, right? Yeah, I'm at the airport. Uh, just checked in, and I'm waiting to do the security checkup. What do you think the reception is going to be like this time? We talked about it after MSG, but now you just won main event against the legend. What do you think it's going to be like? What's waiting for you back nah. home? It's already crazy. A lot of people, uh, a lot of bosses coming to the airport, coming to pick me up. I think after I get there, you're going to see it on the social media and you're going to see how big it is. Yeah. And and last thing for you, Jorginho, have you had a chance to sit back now and look at the past year, what you've done 4-0? It's, it's, it's been a long time since we've had a heavyweight come in like this. It's it's kind of crazy, right? It's surreal to see what you've done in, a, in a, like a 10-month period. Have you had a chance to take it all in? Nah. I, I, 
I never, I didn't do it yet, but it's gonna come. I mean, you know what happening the most of the time. I do the job, you know, I do the job, and then after I'm happy and I'm with my coach, and then a couple of maybe a week after I I just realize what I just did, you know, like I just put down the record or I just fight this big fight against Overeem, and then and that's all those reactions is coming up now, and yeah, I don't realize yet, so. But I'm focusing on recovery, relaxing, and uh, yeah, make sure I'm recovering good, but get back in the gym, and make sure I'm ready for Engano. Enjoy it, my man. Congratulations. What a performance. What a year for you. What a knockout. Everything you've done has just been amazing, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do in 2020. Safe travels, and thank you for squeezing us in before you, you check through security over there. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yes, absolutely. There he is, Biggie Boy, Jairzinho Rosenstrike, uh, a guy who, let's be honest, a lot of us didn't know who he was a year ago right now, and now all of a sudden he's maybe, what, one fight away from fighting for the belt? You beat Francis Ngannou. Who else is there? There's no one left. Look at some of these stats, courtesy of my man Andrew Davis. 10-0, and 4-0 in the UFC. First fighter in modern era UFC history to win four fights in a calendar year by knockout. First fighter, regardless of weight class. Nine of his 10 wins by KO, TKO, including each of the last five. Tied for third latest finish in UFC history and the latest in heavyweight history. The other two, of course, Demetrius Johnson versus Kyoji Hiraguchi, UFC 186. And last year, the uh, Korean zombie Yeye Rodriguez fight. Longest active win streak in heavyweight division and longest active knockout streak overall. He was down 40 to 36, 39, 37, and 39, 37. So he was, all right, so two judges gave him the fourth round on the scorecards entering the fifth. And as of last week, he was 14th ranked heavyweight according to the UFC rankings. That is going to change. A lot is going to change for this man. On the short list for breakthrough fighter, of the year, if the UFC gave out a rookie of the year, which I kind of feel like they should. I was talking about this over the weekend. I feel like there should be a rookie of the year, someone who debuted and like he would be a candidate. Zhang Wei Li, who would be a candidate, I think, for a breakthrough fighter of the year, would not apply. But someone who debuted in that particular year and ended, you look at the entire totality of their year. I mean, I feel like he is the the rookie of the year, no? What a great run for Jairzinho Rosenstrike. All right, so that's the first guest down. 11 more to go. In a few minutes, we're going to be joined by Amanda Nunes, the reigning defending UFC women's bantamweight and featherweight champion. Should I do ad read or a little plug for our show on uh, Friday? All right, let's tell you about our good friends over at Whoop. How about that before we go to Amanda Nunes? I love Whoop. As you know, we're all looking for ways to improve our health, whether it's being smarter about how we train, making a better effort to get more sleep, or simply thinking more about our body's overall wellness. I told you last week, I want to sleep. I don't sleep enough, and I think it's very unhealthy. Today's sponsor, Whoop, is a fitness tracker that goes beyond counting steps and provides 24-7 fitness, sleep, and recovery insights personalized to you. There's nothing else like it on the market. Our lives cause different levels of stress on our body from training to work and our lives at home. Whoop understands that and qualifies, excuse me, quantifies it for you into actionable metrics. Whoop automatically tracks workouts so you can focus on your training. With Whoop, you'll get a daily recovery score that looks at biometrics like heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and sleep performance to let you know how ready your body is to perform. You're also given insight into the intensity of your training in real time and track how strenuous your day is, as well as get next to level sleep insight with suggested sleep times based on how strenuous your day is, track your sleep stages and cycles, and see how much sleep you got compared to how much you needed. That's of great interest to me. Whether you're looking to be smarter about your fitness, better about your sleep, or be more mindful of your body's recovery, Whoop has you covered. Don't wait for New Year's resolutions to start being more in tune with your body. If you're looking to be smarter about how you train, sleep, or recover, Whoop is offering our audience 15% off with this code, Ariel, A-R-I-E-L. That's it, Ariel. Go to whoop.com, that's W-H-O-O-P.com, and use the code Ariel at checkout and optimize your performance with Whoop. All right, let's move along now. UFC 245 coming up. Huge event this Saturday, T-Mobile Arena. Las Vegas, Nevada. Three titles. They've only done this four times before. UFC 33, 205, 214, and 217. One of the title fights, 
women's bantamweight title, Amanda Nunes against Jermaine Durandamy. Amanda Nunes, kind enough to join us on the program. Amanda, how are you? Amanda, are Hello? you there? Yes. Yes, I am. Hello, this is Ariel. Can you how hear are you? Me? I can hear you. Good. Awesome. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm doing good. great. Long time no speak. You're, it's, it's easier to get the president of the United States on this program than you. <laughs> I've been very busy. I know. But now, now is the time, you know? Okay. Well, thank you for oh. doing this. I know it's a busy <laughs> week. Could I ask you, Amanda, considering the fact that you have a win over Jermaine and it was a fairly one-sided quick win, when you were told that she was your next challenger, what did you think? Were you interested in this fight initially? Definitely. You know, she beat the last contender, Aspen Lai. I feel like she was the, the next she deserved. When, when they, I got the call, I, I take it. I wanted this fight at 145 to defend my belt, but she no want to. And it was a couple days back and forth, and I decided to do it. Oh, at interesting. 135. I didn't know that. Why did she not want? Uh, of course, that's a question for her, but do you know why she didn't want it to be at 145? No. No, I, I don't know. Maybe she had her point, but um, I really don't know. Why was it important for you for this fight to be at 145? Honestly, because I, I want to defend my belt. I want 45, 45 as well. And I want to do, keep doing things nobody see before, you know? I want to be the first one to defend the two belts. Are you worried that there's not a lot of competition there at 145 and she was maybe the closest one because she was a former champion there, so this would be your best chance to defend against her? Honestly, Errol, um, you know, MMA is like, this sport is crazy, you know. We never can say, like, oh, she don't have a chance. We have to be ready. Everybody step in the cage. They want that belt, you know. They go and that to get that belt from you. And I really, I really know after this fight, I, I will be able to defend my 145 and I'm going to be ready. Who, no matter what, who, who UFC put in front of me, I'm going to take it, you know, because this is my job. I'm here for that. I'm here for defend that belt. And I want to, I want to keep doing it. This is my job. So, so to be clear, the next one after this one, you want it to be for the 145 title. Yep. And this is the first time I talked to you in a bit, and I'm wondering, what were you thinking when the whole drama with Chris Cyborg happened? She beats Felicia Spencer, and it seems like maybe we're en route to a rematch, and then she ends up not getting re-signed and goes to Bellator. What did you think of that? Were you disappointed that she didn't get re-signed by the UFC? So, uh, I supposed to fight, fight, have the rematch against Chris right after my fight against Cyborg, or against uh, Holly Holmes. Then I call me, and then... And then he asked me, you, you'll be able to do this. You'll be able to fight right after. Three weeks after my fight against the Hall, I say, I'm 100%. I'm going to be ready for. I wanted that, that rematch for sure. And literally, when I went to the internet, the, the, the next day, she was like released by UFC. I don't understand. <laughs> so... Let me let me explain it better. Okay. She she asked to fight Spencer, and she didn't take the the rematch against me right after. She she preferred fight Spencer to because I think it was her last fight in the contract. Yes. And she yes. wanna renegotiate after you know to fight me. I think that was the that was the she think about you know she. I think she want to maybe a little more money and she thinking maybe they's going to sign me after, you know, something like that. But I know, I don't know what, what, what was the reason, but I'm guessing. Okay. So considering your first fight against her, your only fight against her was just 51 seconds long. Did you even care? <clears throat> like, was this a big deal to you to fight her again? Or did you feel like you proved your point? Honestly, I proved I proved my point in that fight. Yeah, you know, I know, I know, I know. Me and my coach, everybody around me, we all knew I'm gonna beat her that night. We all knew I was so ready for that fight, and and it happened. I proved a point, but I feel like all the fans asking for rematch. You know, 
I think that would be huge for women's MMA. Maybe it would be like promote more, you know, the rematch. We would have more like eyes on it. And that was, that would be cool. It would be good for us, for both of us, not only for me. I think about both of us when I, I decide to do it again. Amanda, are you comfortable when people say that you're the greatest female fighter of all time? Is that something that you're okay with? Yeah, I, I should be like, this is the moment that I waited for my whole career, my whole life. I work for that, you know, I I work for for putting my name in the in the top of the mountain. You know, I feel I feel amazing. Do you agree with that? Do you believe that you are the greatest of all time? I am. Do you think it's unproven? Do you think it's unfair to distinguish between male and female? Should you just be considered one of the best f- fighters, period, of all time? I ask you that. What do you think? You're asking me? I want to know what you think. <laughs> yes. I prove. If I, you know, I was just watching your, your Strike Force debut. I don't know if you remember this against uh, Julia Budd. Um, and this was around 10 years ago and you came in, that was your American debut. You were five and one, I think you came in there and you beat her in like 14 seconds. And the broadcasters were saying, Oh, this could be the one to beat Chris Cyborg. But after that, you, you went three and three in your next six fights. Uh, it was a bit of a, you know, a tough go after that fight. If I would have told that Amanda Nunez who came into strike force and went through Julia, Budd, if I would have told her that you'd have ended up the decade as maybe the greatest of all time, that things would have turned out the way they turned out for you this decade. Would you have believed me? Honestly, when I started doing this, I know that's a matter of time. You know, every fight have the, the time to evolve. You know, I just need the time to evolve, you know, putting my things together. I feel like in, it's not only in a, in a fight life, but in the real life, you have it up and downs. You know, you have to go through you have to to really uh, find your way to put your things together. And in that moment in Strike Force, I was very young to, you know, in a just step in this country. That was one of my dreams was coming to this country. And that huge win against Julia Ba was was amazing for me. It was kind of like, man, I, I think I've been I've been doing the right thing, you know. And after that fight, yeah, I a lot of people in the promoter even talked to my manager at the time. Like, I think she, she's going to be the next one fight Cyborg. You know, be, you guys be ready. But at the same time, I saw the, the humor UFC is going to buy uh, Strike Force. You know, my, my maybe not happen because that, but are we we was talk about maybe fight cyborg maybe and i kind of like you know at that at that age kind of like all right but i knew the life would put it, everything together for me you know i have to go through a couple losses that is that is normal for a fighter a lot of that is not good i i don't like losing but sometimes you you have to to learn things, you know, to put your feet on the ground and to find your way back. Some some fighters have to have to lose it to really get the strength the strength they needed. And I was one of that, you know. And I have to lose a couple times to really like put my shit together and now I'm here. One of the interesting things about this fight week is that there's two American top team fighters competing for the belt. And usually that's very exciting. But in this particular case, Colby Covington is the other one. And there's so much drama surrounding him. How do you feel about sharing the, the bill, so to speak, with Colby? Are, are you guys okay behind the scenes? Or, you know, he said things about you. And I know a lot of the fighters at ATT don't like him right now or upset with him. How do you feel about him? I don't have much to do with the other situation. I pretty much walk in the gym, do my things. And that's it. I feel like everybody know what they want for their life. You know, I'm not having nothing to do with that situation. Okay, fair enough. And and finally, you know, your your win over Jermaine uh, six years ago now, 
a little over six years, was a quick one. Three minutes, 56 seconds of the first round fight for the <clears> troops. <throat> I remember it well. Do you feel like you have to beat her in a quicker amount of time? Like if you beat her in the third round, people will be like, ah, it wasn't as impressive because, you know, it's a tough situation when you beat someone in the first round. Now you have to fight them again all these years later. Do you feel like you have to do something even better this time around? Honestly, I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to five, five, five rounds. Honestly, if, every time that I go to five rounds, I get better and better. And that is my goal, you know, go as far as possible in the fight. But if she make a mistake, if I be able to put in my hands first, I will get this done. Or if she, she do any mistake, she kick me, she come close to me. I'm going to take her down. I will submit her. It's just a matter of time in the fight to finish it. But if I not be able to get the distance, if I not be able to get the moment, I will take this fight to five rounds. That is, finish it fast is not, the, is not the many things. The many things you fight, this fight be smart and capitalize. It's always a pleasure to watch you fight, Amanda. I wish you the best on Saturday night. And, and don't you. be a stranger, okay? You know, mi casa, su casa. You can come here anytime. Uh, I'm not a stranger. I'm not a stranger. I just need the space sometimes. I know. I think I know. everybody needs space. Of course. I understand. And uh, congratulations <laughs> on all your success. And say hello to Nina for us as well. Thanks. She say hello as well. Okay. <laughs> We'll see you in Las Vegas. There she is, the reigning defending UFC women's featherweight and bantamweight champion, Amanda Nunes. She defends the bantamweight title this Saturday in a rematch against Jermaine Durandamy. That's going to be a lot of fun, especially, I think, in the striking department. Now, uh, the, the first ever UFC women's title fight happened at UFC 157 back in 2013. It was Ronda Rousey against Liz Carmouche. Liz Carmouche, in fact, was the very first female fighter to step foot in a UFC octagon, Anaheim, California, February. You recall one of the great moments in the history of this sport. Well, unfortunately, her UFC run has come to an end. She found out on Friday while in Washington, D.C., doing promotional work for the UFC. Her management, I'm told, found out on Thursday. They informed her on Friday, and now she is no longer a part of the UFC. She was released from the company and is a free agent. She's kind enough to join us on the show to talk about that. There she is, Liz Carmouche in the house. Liz, how are you? Good. How are you? How how have the last three or so days been like for you with all the hoopla surrounding this news? Uh, it's been interesting. I have uh, a lot of people from the UFC. I mean, like you said, I was out there in Washington, D.C., so I had a lot of the people that work for the UFC come up to me and just express their embarrassment and their surprise at everything that occurred and apologize. And I just had to keep reassuring them, like, you guys didn't do anything. I have no, no hard feelings against you. Um, so that, that's been interesting just to have so many differences. It seems like the communication between the head and the body were cut off, and I just experienced that firsthand. Could you tell us where you were exactly when you found out this news and, and then afterwards what your reaction was? Uh, yeah, I was in actually in the car with Reed Harris and a few of the other fighters. We'd just come back from a hospital and uh, a children's ward talking to some kids who were going through different treatment, and then some adults were going through chemotherapy. And we just returned from doing this. We had all the high-ups from the hospitals just express how grateful they were and how much it made a difference going out there. And we're on the drive back, about to go get food, and my management calls. And I'm like, well, that can't be a good thing if I'm in the car. Maybe a good thing. Uh, and uh, so I just had to just save face because, like I said, it wasn't for anybody that was in the vehicle. They didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was nothing on their part. So the last thing I want to do is be upset or lash out towards them. So I just had to kind of be like, all right, well. This is going to be a very weird drive back, but I'm just going to have to endure it and get through. And I uh, didn't even tell anything to anybody in the vehicle because I just didn't know where we were at with things. And so, of course, Reed and, and multiple other people were even more surprised when they get back. And they're like, why didn't you tell us? Oh, my God. This is news to me, too. <laughs> wow. And, and what was the reason that you were given or at least that your management was given and then relayed to you? Uh, so since I've been with the organization, especially over the last few years, I've had a lot of difficulty getting fights and it's not because of injury. It's not for lack of readiness and in preparation going into the fight. It's because it seems like all the opponents that I've been offered have turned down all the fights. And I mean, the frequency that I prefer is to do like four fights a year, three fights, however many I possibly can. And constantly we were just told that everybody was saying no. And the reason that they gave is that they're really trying to build up the division. And every person, every female that they brought in to the 125 division, I've been able to beat them. So it's not really giving them the opportunity to build up the division that they wanted to. So unfortunately, for the best well-being of the division, they had to cut me 
to give me an opportunity to go elsewhere and get the fights I need. Is that a hard pill to swallow? I mean, you're doing your job, you're tough, and you're being told. It reminds me, actually, of John Fitch, Yushin Okami, Jake Shields, guys who are highly ranked. You're in the top five, I believe, top four, last I checked, and you're being told that you're almost too good, like you're you're being a roadblock, right, for other up-and-comers, and so they have to get rid of you. Is that is that tough to digest? Uh, you know, you would think it is, but at the same time, what that tells me is that they're so scared of me that they can't do anything about it. I mean... It'd be worse. They're like, oh, you're just not good enough. Sorry, we're going to have to cut you instead of all the females are afraid of me. I'd much rather have it fear for them than it be that I just wasn't skilled enough or had made a mistake that cost it instead of it just really that nobody wants to face me because they feel like even in if they won the fight, it's still going to come at the cost of them potentially going to the hospital and need to take time off. I'd much rather that occur than th the other. <laughs> Did you have any inclination after that fight against Valentina Shevchenko in August that that might be your last UFC fight? Did that thought ever cross your mind? Oh, uh, absolutely. And it even crossed my mind before the Valentina fight. It just seemed like more and more that I would ask them for opportunities to fight. And they just kept turning it down and saying that they just couldn't set anything up for me. And then particularly after this, I had, I had said like, please, you know, I finally got two fights in a year. Can I make it three? I just, I want to fight. I'm healthy. I want to get back in there. And uh, they said that I was on standby potentially for the end of the year for a fight. And then all these organizations for jiu-jitsu hit me up about super fights, quintets, and paying opportunities. And I'd asked the UFC and they said, no, you're still on standby. Yeah. And that to me was a little bit odd being that here we come to the end of the year and I haven't been offered a fight. So I just kind of had an inkling that it might be going this way. And, and so I wonder if that is a hard, I mean, your fight, your last fight was four months ago. Why did it take so long to make the decision? Nothing has happened in your career since August. Why sit on it for so long? Yeah, and that's honestly the hardest part is because these jiu-jitsu opportunities are coming up and I'm all about challenging myself and just staying as active as possible. So that alone meant that I'm just sitting on the shelf for four months, which is really difficult because that's not what I want to do. And then if you think of it in retrospective, it's, hey, it's the end of the year and I'm trying to provide for my family. And these were also paying opportunities for jiu-jitsu. That's where it's really difficult because I shut down five different offers, all of which were paying substantially that would have allowed me to, to put more food on the table and to spoil my son for his birthday and for Christmas. And I had to turn those down. That's the hardest part to swallow. After this news came out and, and the reaction to the news, I'm wondering, did anyone, you know, any decision maker, if you will, from the UFC call you, Dana White, Hunter Campbell, Mick Maynard, Sean Shelby, did anyone reach out to you personally and explain why they're doing this? No, nobody said anything to me. Uh, really, it was people like Reed Harris and uh, Susie with the UFC, people like that that just approached me and just expressed their surprise at it and apologized for how it went down. But as far as like the executives of the UFC, nobody had reached out, no. Does that hurt you? Yes and no. I mean, there's been a lot of change of, of ownership and change of hands. So in a lot of ways, I'm not surprised. And I, I think of it as like a breakup. You want to try and do it as easy as possible for the person that's breaking up. And that's kind of how I look at it is they just didn't really want to face it. So it's easier to kind of have my management do it for them. Did you continue with the promotional work in D.C. after you found out? Was there anything left to do? Uh, there's nothing left to do except go to the fights. And the reality being is that I, I made new friends out there with the fighters there and got to hear about their teammates. And I want to go out and support them and see them put on a show. And regardless of how it went down, I was looking at it like, hey, I came out here to do a job. And yes, it took me away from my actual paying job for a week and away from uh, birthday activities for my son. But I came out here to support the fighters and to, to see them put on the best show that they can. And I'm, I'm not the person that's just going to tuck my tail and walk away. So I went out there just to do a last one and, and enjoy it for myself. And what is that paying job that you're referring to? Uh, so I'm a personal trainer, and then I also teach uh, classes like Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. And so that meant for a week, I had to call into my job and say, I'm not going to be training. I'm not going to be teaching and uh, just suck it up to go out to this event. <laughs> wow. And and it was your son's birthday this week, this past weekend as well? Uh, no, his birthday is on the 22nd, but okay. we had months ago planned out going up to Knott's Berry Farm and doing this big celebration for him. Uh, because all of us were able to have that time off. And then with the UFC not, not offering him anything, we'd schedule that. And I had to tell them to all go without me and miss out on his birthday party. And so was it, who reached out to you to do this promotional work? Was it the UFC? Yes. Okay. And did you, because uh, I, I saw uh, an article on MMA Junkie, did you pay for your travel to DC? Is that, is that common for this type of stuff? 
Oh, no, they paid for the travel. I just had to take off from work for a week, and that's okay. where the cost came in. Gotcha. Especially, like, this, with being my son's birthday and being this close to the holidays, the last thing I want to do is in the month of December or November to take off any time from work to not be able to provide what I want to. Okay, so but they did pay—they did, because I think there was some confusion— they paid you to go over there. You didn't have to pay out of pocket to be there, correct? You just lost they out paid on... for the travel in the hotel. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And do, 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 do you just get paid for your travel? You don't get like a stipend or something for the appearance or anything like that? Yeah, correct. All it is is just the, the hotel and plane ride. Understood. Okay. Um, do you want to keep fighting? Oh, absolutely. I'm not done. Um, I mean, with every fight, I just feel like I'm making more improvements. I'm seeing within myself more growth mentally and physically. And I've been working with so many different teams now. And there are just so many things I want to show in my game that I've been working on that I'm in no way done. I see your your teammate and good friend and the Bellator champion in the same weight class, 125, Elima McFarlane, campaigning for Bellator to sign you. Would you like to go to Bellator? Are they at the top of that list? She's even said that her dream fight is against you out of total respect, which I'm sure you know and you've talked about. Is that a place where you would like to end up? Oh, absolutely. Especially because when I was in Strike Force, I got to know Scott Croker and I got to know Richard Chu. And I had nothing but good relationships when the UFC bought Strike Force out and they ultimately went to Bellator. So that would be a perfect fit because I already know them and I have a good relationship with them. On top of, I have my teammate that's leading in that division and has the belt. And we talked about it for years that a great fight for both of us would be each other because we're main training partners. We know our weaknesses and our strengths. We know how to put on a good show. And we feel like for both of us, that would just be a really good fit. But I mean, there's also great organizations out there too. But ultimately, yeah, Bellator's at the top of the list and I would love to go fight for them. Have any promotions, including Bellator, reached out to you or your management since this news came out? Uh, yeah, the great thing is, is all of them are reached out. So it's really nice. just a matter of finding the best relationship that's going to be a fit and the fight frequency too, because I, the last thing I want to do is go to an organization where I'm only going to fight once a year. I mean, that's the position I was in with the UFC and it ultimately wasn't making me happy. I want to fight as often as possible. So I'm trying to find the organization that's going to fit into that lifestyle. Are you close to agreeing to a new deal? Oh, uh, there's definitely offers on the table. We want to, like I said, weigh the best decision possible and what makes sense for my career before we decide on something. And by the way, this idea of fighting Alima, like, like, would you both train at the same gym as you prepare? Like, have you actually talked this out? Because it's very rare to have two teammates openly talk about how exciting the idea of, uh, of fighting each other is. It doesn't happen often. Yeah, all the time. We're, we're our go-to training partners. I mean, we both participate in Underwater Torpedo League, and we're the main people that are thrashing out. We're always on opposite teams competing against each other. In the gym, when it comes to somebody being in fight camp, and we know that, like, oh, we don't have enough. It's a holiday, so there's not a lot of training partners. We're the go-to people that we give each other a call, like, hey, I'll be down at the gym right away, whether it's we're doing strength and conditioning or striking practice, grappling practice, no matter what, we're always our main training partners. And going back to your last fight, is there any part of you that thinks if that fight was maybe a little more exciting that you would have been kept? Do you feel like this is maybe, you know, in response to how that fight played out and the criticism afterwards? I definitely suspected because of the way that the fight went that that would ultimately be the reason I got cut. But after hearing how the discussions that went on between the UFC and my management, that's in no way what it was at all. Uh, so that's a little bit reassuring knowing that that just leaves more room for growth in the future of my fighting. Do you, do you leave the UFC with any regrets? Uh, just that I didn't take that belt for some <laughs> Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe even more so the Ronda one. You were very close to finishing her. How crazy would, you know, like the entire history of the sport would be different had that fight gone a little differently, right? Oh, absolutely. It would be a completely different sport. And I think that um, had I won the belt against Ronda in the initial fight for women into the UFC, that I would have probably been able to, to push to get 125 moves even earlier into the divisions mm. than had to have a few years to do it. Do you, do you think about that fight a lot? Uh, only when it's brought up. Okay. I mean, I really have past it. It was, it, was, it was such an important thing for me for the first two years after it occurred because it motiv motivated me that much more to work on my training and to grow and evolve. But since then, I feel like I'm not even close to the same fighter that I was. So I've let that person go and I just look towards the future. How soon are you hoping to sign with someone? Uh, the sooner the better. I mean, like I said, I want to fight as frequently as possible. So the sooner that I get signed, uh, the 
guarantee is to, to be able to fight soon after that. And, you know, you hear from some people who say, I leave the UFC, I want to eventually come back. Is that part of the mindset as well? Or are you closing the door on that chapter in your life? I mean, uh, if I can, of course, like you want to fight against the best in the world and to, to challenge yourself. And if, you know, I make a great run with a different organization, the UFC calls me back, there's always going to be that thought. But at the same time, the unprofessionalism and the way that they released me makes me wonder, like, are, how good of are they going to treat me if I were to go back? Or is this just potentially something that's going to happen again? So I think that I'll, I'll finish out my career with an organization that I can have a really good relationship that's going to treat me well, and ultimately I can give back to them. Liz, I appreciate you doing this very much. I'm sorry to hear this news. I'm sorry to hear how it played out, especially. But I know that there are a lot of people interested in your services. I have a feeling that you will not be a free agent for a very long time. So good luck to you. And uh, congrats on a great run in the UFC. You are one of the pioneers of this sport. And uh, I hope you know that and, and are receiving a lot of love for that. And I think it's a great thing to see. Thank you so much. All right. We'll talk to you soon. There she is, Liz Carmouche, one half of the very first fight in UFC women's MMA history, the very first female fighter to step foot in a UFC cage prior to that fight at UFC 157 against Ronda Rousey. If you've never seen the fight, she was that close to submitting Ronda. Uh, Ronda got out and uh, eventually submitted her, but uh, just unfortunate to see how it played out uh, over the past week with her release while being in Washington for that promotional work. Unfortunate stuff, but again, I have a feeling that she's not going to be out of a job for a very long time. I appreciate her doing that and her management team as well. Let's go back to the DC card now and say hello to one of the stars of the show. He may, uh, when this month is done, he may also win our Nose Award for Submission of the Year, the very prestigious Helwani Nose Award. There he is, Thug Nasty himself, Bryce Mitchell, who scored the second ever twister in UFC history against Matt Sales on Saturday. Bryce, congratulations. How are you? Uh, thank you, my brother. I'm good as always, and I appreciate your time. It's great to talk to you, my friend. It has been, uh, it has been several months. Uh, let's clear something up here off the bat. You score the Twister, just the second in UFC history. First one was Korean Zombie, Leonard Garcia, around 10 years ago. Did you really just learn that off of YouTube? Is that true? Yeah, I just seen it on YouTube, man. Uh, <laughs> hell, Eddie Bravo gives a, such a detailed description of how to do it. I mean, anybody can learn on YouTube. He, he, he breaks down every detail. Uh, there are some, un, some, some things that are necessary for MMA you need to know because it's actually a good ground and pound spot too. It's if the opponent's resisting the twister, uh, you can just ground and pound them and knock them unconscious from there. So that's, you know, he don't go over that on YouTube. He just does the jujitsu version of it, but yeah, it's, it's there on YouTube. And Nobody so I believe me, I tell people all the time, I get stuff on YouTube. They don't believe. Me. <laughs> when did you first see this particular maneuver and, and kind of come up with the idea that you're going to try this in a fight? At least five years, I'd say. At least. Have you ever tried to pull it off in a fight? Um, I don't think I have ever tried it in a fight. I don't think I have. Mm -mm. Was it something that you were trying to do in this fight? Like, was it part of the game plan? Did you feel like there was an opening there, or did it just present itself? It, it just presented itself. It just flowed really naturally into what I was already doing, and... uh yeah, th I mean, this fight, I was just so much uh, better than I was in any of my other fights because of I, just the concept that I was uh, using going into this fight. You know, it, it just, that's what opened that up. What do you mean by the concept? Well, Coach said cook them to the bone. Oh, what does that mean? And Well, you know, a lot of people, they like to cook them and take them out too early. But when you cook them to the bone, that meat just falls right off the bone. And that's what I did. Coach said cook them all the way to the bone. And I cooked them all the way to the bone. Meat fell right off that bone. Is that the first time he's said that to you? No, Coach has been telling me, you need to cook this guy. You need to cook him good. He said, this is, he said, this, you ain't got enough time to cook them like the stove, like the stove top. He said, we're going to put them in a pressure cooker. We're going to cook them hard and fast. Wow. And that's, what, that's what I did. And by the way, um, if one were to have perhaps something like, I don't know, squirrel, would you cook squirrel to the bone as well? You always cook the squirrel to the bone. That's okay. tough meat right there. You That's right. Are you celebrating perhaps with a little squirrel soup this evening? Man, I ate all the squirrel, and 
and uh, yeah, we got some fish, but that's about it. We're gonna have a little fish fry. That's all we got right now. I've I've ate all my squirrel and rabbit. What's <laughs> funny is my mom, a rabbit got killed. My mom's dog killed a rabbit in the backyard while I was gone, and she wasted all the meat. She threw the rabbit away and was like, she was she she started crying and and whatnot. She's like, oh my god, a rabbit got killed, and then threw it over the fence, wasted all the meat, but. Almost had a rabbit waiting on me. Oh my gosh, back. that would have just made the whole experience even better, right? It would have been great. And, and by the way, when you say that you 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 kind of exhausted all your supply of squirrel, what, what do you mean? Like you just there's none around anymore? Oh no, I just eat them all. Okay, like, you know you probably get about six at once or something. Four, you know, four is a good number to do something with. Like you know, make like a squirrel pot pie or a squirrel stew or something. Get you about four of them. Okay. Um, well, uh, I mean, certainly uh, very fitting for the occasion. Uh, did you know that there had only been one in UFC history? Were you aware of that one twister? Yes, sir. That was uh, uh, what's his name? Korean Zombie. That's yep. right. You knew that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I watched that fight, and uh, yeah, Leonard Garcia kind of done the same thing that Matt Sales did. It's like. I think that if it was maybe a jujitsu match, they would have locked their hands because people have seen the twister and you know. But in an MMA fight, man, there's punches flying. There's punches flying. There's elbows flying. You're so worried about uh, getting your face broke. And uh, when you turn to turn away, you're more likely to leave your arm behind in an MMA fight. It seems like, you know, it's just like both twisters that have been done, the dude was just completely oblivious to defending it i mean they leonard garcia gave up the arm matt sales gave up the arm um it's just a matter of time where somebody locks their hands and then they get ground and pounded and uh whatnot but yeah they, he was just unaware of it you know yeah what does that feel like do, do you hear the neck kind of cranking there what does that feel like as someone who's applying the submission man i've never ever cranked into a twister that hard oh my gosh I mean, that's something that you you would never crank into a twister that hard in a gym. If you if you crank that hard into a twister at gym, you ought to be kicked out of your gym. You know, you, I mean, I was trying to break that dude's back. Uh, you know, when I when I hipped in, you can you can do a gable grip at first, and I've done a gable grip at first. Then I rear uh, did the uh, lion killer grip. I readjusted, did the lion killer, and once I put the lion killer in and then hipped. Yeah, I've just never felt a twister uh, with that much tension on it, man. It's like, you know, I don't know what gives first. It it fucks your hips, your back, and your neck up. So I really don't know what's going to break first. Oh, my. But it felt like, you know how, like, when you pull a rubber band? Yeah. Like one of those, uh, like one of those ankle rubber bands, you know, you do for yoga workouts or what? It's something like that. Sure. You know, like one of those little big those big rubber bands. You pull it, but as you pull it, you feel more tension on it. Yeah. Well, I, that's how his back felt. His back felt like a, it felt like a big rubber band, but I felt resistance, but then I felt myself pulling oh my. through the resistance. Like I met, I felt tension and then I felt it releasing and I felt more tension and it just felt like I was tearing something. And I honestly think the best thing for him to do right now would be for him to let me twist her the other side. And so he would be all evened up. You know, I'm no chiropractor, but I guarantee you he's got some crooked walk going on right now. He's got some some pimp walk going on. <laughs> Wait, so you are <laughs> inviting me... you are inviting Matt to come to Arkansas to have you twist his body the other way to even things out? Is that what you're saying? I will slowly twist the other side back into place. <laughs> I will never crank that hard again. Oh my gosh! Uh, you know, but I would that would be Dr. Bryce recommends you you get in a twister on the opposite side and slowly, uh, yeah, stretch the other side. It's gonna line everything back up because when your vertebrae and hips and stuff get all twisted, they get all all twisted, like twisted up. Yeah, you wanna un you wanna untwist it the other day, you, you, the other way. You know what I'm saying? Just like when my nuts got caught in that drill, they got twisted up one way. I reversed it and untwisted them. Oh gosh! It's the same concept. <laughs> okay, it's somewhat ironic, right? I mean, you've you've been doing a lot of twisting in your past year and a half or so. It's gone full circle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, why haven't you fought since March? Why were you out for nine months? 
man, I was just training really hard, just preparing myself. You know, I'm not in this sport for uh, quick money. I won't be the best in the world. You know, I'm far, I'm far from in my prime, I believe. Uh, he only got one career. I really don't like the idea of just taking quick fights just to take them. I like putting everything into it and uh, just giving it my absolute best. Um, you know, all my energy, everything like that. And so I had a lot of stuff going on outside the gym. And, uh, but yeah, I trained full time. I did everything outside the gym that I wanted to and trained full time as hard as I could. So everything you know, I okay? Felt like taking, yeah, everything's okay. I'm just sore. I lost some weight from that weight cut, but uh, I'll put the weight back on and I'll be feeling better here, uh, you know, just pretty soon. Okay. And, you know, you, you, you have the, you've talked in the past about, you know, trying to improve your, your life, your family's life, getting this win, getting the bonus. What does this do for you? Uh, we're we're going to have us a big little workshop for them kids to stay in. Okay. And uh, we ain't going to have to worry about, you know, cut money off of this or cut money off that. Can I afford slab concrete on the whole thing? Hell yeah, I can. You know, I can, I can slab the whole thing now. Uh, you know, so, you know, I don't have to skimp on any of my materials. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to have, I'm going to build it the way that I want it done, exactly how I want it done for me and, and for my woman and for these kids. And I'm going to have money left over afterwards. I'm not going to have to stress about, uh, you know, skipping on <laughs> on some supplies and uh, making it a little bit less big than I wanted it to. It's it's going to be a nice little workshop area. I'm building these, uh, I'm building a little a living quarters slash workshop area, just one big, one big ass metal building, basically pole barn style. Okay. And are, are you still in the trailer or have you moved out? Oh, the trailer's good to go, man. I'm a happy camper. Okay. <laughs> Pardon the pun, or maybe not. Um, all right. So life is good. You're happy. The one thing that we need to settle are the shorts. What's going on? Why are they, why are they depriving you of these shorts? What's happening? Do we have an update on this? Man, you know they don't want them shorts. That's the last thing they want. Why? You know, I don't know. You know, you talk about making making me marketable. Those shorts will make me even more marketable. Sure. In, in my opinion. I mean, people will look. Hell, after the fight, a dude come up to me from the crowd. He had a pair of camo shorts on and a spray-painted shirt. It said He spray-painted a shirt that said, Doug Nasty. He came up to me and told me he loved me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing you know like you don't think people you don't think people want to see me in camo shorts you got a guy in the crowd running around in camo shorts with a spray paint thug nasty <laughs> shirt you don't think people want to see that shit people want to see me in the camo shorts i want you know, to they, see you i don't get the, I, want, I don't see what the problem is i don't either man have I they given either. you a reason i'm gonna keep giving. no they don't i hardly even talk to anybody man um Matt Weevil does all my talking for me and stuff, but sure. And and I, you know, he don't have the power to just say, "Hey, he's gonna have the camo shorts now." You know, I don't know. You know, I don't know, but I'm just gonna keep giving him help. You know, somebody's gonna have to fold eventually. It ain't gonna be me. You think I'm gonna shut up anytime soon? No. <laughs> Listen, you'll that be champion. You'll be champion soon enough, and then they'll be making you as many shorts, uh, camo, non-camo, whatever as you want. So I have no, uh, I have no doubt about that. And so do you want to take another, you know, extended period off now, or do you want to get back in there relatively soon? And if so, anyone come to mind? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know if I want to do it now. Or so. I, I haven't really thought about it. I just woke up and I actually got my first day of good sleep. Oh, uh, I, I'll tell you who, you know, I don't ever call nobody. I've never called nobody out in my career. And uh, there is one person I'm going to call out real quick. Okay. And uh, that that's Floyd Mayweather. Oh. He's, he's talking. Yeah, he's talking about he's wanting to box some MMA fighter. And, uh, you know, I watched some, M some interview of his just probably 10 years ago. And it's pissed me off ever since. What do you say? He, I seen Floyd in an interview. This was probably 10 years ago. Maybe he's changed his opinion. Maybe he just had a bad day. I don't know. But he said that. Uh, in the interview, he said MMA is for white dudes who can't box. Mm. You know, that's what that's what he said, word for word. He said MMA is for for stupid white dudes who can't box. Blah blah blah. You know, I'll box them. 
he, he's talking about he wants to come over and box a UFC fighter. I'll beat his ass. You know, that's all I got to say to him. And he thinks I'm scared of him for a minute. He fights like a bitch. He runs. He's scared. I have never gone into a fight in my life, Ariel, trying to win on points. Never. I, when I go into that cage, I fight to kill somebody, you know. And Floyd Mayweather, he fights like a bitch. He runs. He point fights the whole fight. Most of the fights are boring. It, you know, if he wants a real fight, then it's right here. It's right here, buddy. I'll kick your ass. You know how hard I'll hit Floyd Mayweather? How hard? I'll hit Floyd, I'll hit Floyd so damn hard he'll wake up and be able to read a book. That's how hard I'll hit him. His brain will be so scrambled from my hands, he'll wake up being able to read. The doctors, will, they're going to think it's a miracle. They're going to say, oh, wow, this fucking idiot can read. You know, that's how hard I'll hit Floyd Mayweather. So he can fuck right off. He wants a boxing match. I'll give it to him. This, this stupid white guy will box him. Wow. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. The challenge has been extended. Bryce Mitchell, UFC budding superstar, wants a piece of Floyd Mayweather Jr. in a boxing match and says that he's going to knock him out. Uh, I, I, I was expecting you to say, you know, another fighter, fellow UFC fighter, but uh, why not? Shoot your shot, my man. Why not? Why not you? You've been doing great things. Well, yeah, man. He's been talking. He's been saying MMA fighters. Are for, he said it's for white guys who can't box. And then, yeah. he, and then he has the audacity to say he wants to box an MMA fighter. He wants to box a UFC fighter. Well, I'll do it. You got one right here, buddy. Okay. Bryce, congratulations on the victory, my man. That was great stuff, and uh, perhaps we'll be talking very soon. Uh, you, you, you might be winning the uh, Submission of the Year Award. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. You're the man, Bryce. We'll talk to you soon. Congrats again. All right, thank you for having me. There Peace he is. <laughs> Thug Nasty, uh, one of the great characters in our sport, and uh, what a performance, what a win, what a submission Saturday against Matt Sale's second ever twister in UFC history. Now, before we get to our next guest, Paul Felder, who in fact was a part of the very first Helwani Roadshow, let me tell you about what's going on this Friday, my friends, Friday, December 13th. There you see it. Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club at the Link Promenade, right next to Caesars on the Strip, December 13th, 7 p.m. Pacific. It's the second Helwani Roadshow. And just like the one back in June, which, if I'm being honest... Some of the most fun that I've ever had in my entire career. 300 plus people, five MMA superstars on the stage, trivia challenge. I've always thought that a trivia show would be perfect for the sport. Did it one time back in the day for Fox. It was great. We never did it again. Now we are doing it again. And the one in June was so much fun. Uh, Stipe Miocic won. You'll recall he got the belt right over there, the NWO title. The Nose World Order title. Now we're doing it again this Friday, right before UFC 245. 24 hours before UFC 245, right after the ceremonial weigh-ins. It doesn't coincide. I've had some people ask me, well, I missed the weigh-ins, press conference, none of that. After the uh, weigh-ins, after the press conference, all that stuff, go to the Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club at the Link Promenade, and it's four fighters, new fighters, going head-to-head-to-head-to-head. To head to head to head. Who are they? I'm glad you asked. Number one. Michael Chiesa, tough live champion, the man who meets Rafael Dos Anjos, January 25th, has already predicted that he will win via text. I have it. I have the proof. Says that he's an MMA buff, a nerd, a trivia buff. He knows everything about MMA. Encyclopedia has said that he will win. He's one of the contestants. I'm very excited to see if he can, uh, you know, put his money where his mouth is. Number two, the face of the women's strawweight division. You want a champion, the young woman who will be challenging for that belt that she made famous for so many years. March 7th, she returns in a title fight against the new champ, Zhang Wei Li, she, one of the greatest female fighters of all time, the pride of Poland, Joanna Andrzejczyk. She's contestant number two. She's going for the belt on March 7th, but first, she goes for that belt. More prestigious, if you ask me. Number three, how about Dominic Reyes, the man who will be going up against John Jones, February 8th, trying to be the first man to legitimately beat Johnny Bones Jones. In a title fight, in any fight, Matt Hamill fight doesn't count. First man to unseat John Jones. Could it be him? Undefeated. Climbing through the ranks. Superstar. Budding. Meteoric rise. But first, goes for that belt. NWO. Dominic Reyes has already expressed some confidence going into this matchup. And number four, a fan favorite. Bougie Beast. The pride of Houston. The Black Beast. 
the one and only Derek Lewis, who claims that he doesn't watch a lot of MMA. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Great character. A fun mix of personalities. And this is what's so fun. There's three rounds. First round is just general trivia. Second round, they get paired up uh, honeymooner style. So they have to answer questions about their, their, their partner, if you will. And then the third round is a uh, sort of speed round where you have to answer one question and name as many people as possible in that minute. But each round, you can ask a friend, you can ask someone who's in the audience. So it's, you know, it's fun for the audience. Audience participation is always a great thing. You can be involved. There'll be a Q&A afterwards, answer some questions, and there'll be giveaways. We've got some great ones this time, couple. And then afterwards, there's a meet and greet. And so I will uh, hang out with everyone, shake hands, take pictures, whatever you want. Tickets are on sale right now. If you go on my Instagram, at Ariel Hawani, the link is there. Uh, it's on my Twitter as well. It's the pinned tweet on my Twitter, Ticketmaster. Tickets are very cheap. There you go. Some more information for all of you. Again, it's this Friday, and I really want to thank uh, everyone at ESPN who allows me to do this, in particular, Elizabeth Fearman who does a phenomenal job doing these road shows. Just did a great one for uh, the great Adrian Wojnarowski at Emerson College with Sam Presti of the Oklahoma City Thunder. They do an amazing job putting on these road shows, and they're intimate, and they're fun, and it's a way of connecting with the people. It's a way of giving back, if you will, having a good time before the events. Like I said, the last one was in June in Chicago. Now we're taking it to Viva Las Vegas, and it's a fun week in Las Vegas. On Thursday, there's the Quintet Show, which I'm very interested in checking that out. It's uh, Pride versus WC versus Strike Force versus UFC. Friday, if you're looking for something to do Friday night, come check out my show. And then Saturday, it's 2.45. So again, one more time, if you go on my Instagram, in the bio, there's a Ticketmaster link. And if you go on my Twitter, pin tweet, uh, there's a link right over there. So I hope you'll be able to be there if you're in Vegas. If you're not going to the event, if you're around, I don't know, Arizona, California, come check it out. I promise you it's a great time. And uh, I really thank everyone who has already purchased tickets because that means a lot to me. It's something I've always wanted to do. You'll recall New York Rick and I have talked about doing this many a times over the years. And by the way, New York Rick will also be there. He's a part of the show as well. So you'll get to meet the most famous uh, person in mixed martial arts, the brains behind everything that we do over here. The great New York Rick will be in attendance as well. So there you have it. There's the information. That's yeah, well, you know, you know, I was, I was trying to, That's real hurtful. I was I trying to, uh, corporate Jake won't be there. Nope. So, you know, other people will be there. Got to hold part of the ESPN team. You got Jordan, you got Elizabeth, you got Charlie, you got Ray. Who else do we have? We have a lot of people there, but not corporate Jake. <laughs> providing without commentary. Anyway, let me tell you now about our good friends over at Ancestry before we get to uh, Paul Felder. Of course, TST will be there. I'm so sorry, TST. How could I forget TST making his Vegas debut? Mr. Minimalist himself, as you take a look at the UFC 245 card. Anyway, Ancestry. Authenticity is paramount. <laughs> Uh, TST, this was bound to happen at some point. Anyway, as you know, in a time where it's so easy... That could have been a lot worse. No one understands what I'm saying, but anyway, I'll leave it at that. In a time where it's so easy to get caught up in focusing on consumer spending and the latest and greatest in tech, we want to tell you all that Ancestry DNA is a truly meaningful gift with the power to connect families and spark meaningful conversation over the holidays. Let me tell you how. Ancestry DNA is a truly amazing, thoughtful, profound gift that you can give someone. Not just over the holidays, but anytime. Every family has a story. And Ancestry DNA can reveal ethnic origins and provide historical details that bring unique family stories to life. Ancestry DNA is a gift that can bring them closer to their origins and to each other. See how the details of one's family's past can spark new conversations with their family today. Ancestry DNA doesn't just tell you which countries you're from, but also it can pinpoint these specific regions within them, giving you insightful geographic detail about your history. Trace the past of your recent ancestors and learn how and why your family moved from place to place around the world. Isn't that amazing? Life do spit in a little tube, put it in a box, and voila. From discovering origins in over 500 regions to the most connections to living relatives, no other DNA test delivers such a unique interactive experience. Only 
Ancestry DNA uses the world's largest family history database to give a deeper and more detailed DNA story. You can combine what you learn from your DNA with over 100 million family trees and billions of records for more insight into your genealogy and origins. Save big on Ancestry DNA with special holiday pricing and spark meaningful conversations around the holiday dinner table. Give the gift that can unwrap their history. Head over to Ancestry.com slash MMA to get your Ancestry DNA kit on sale today. Once again, that is Ancestry.com slash MMA. Later in the program, we're going to be joined by a who's who. How many are we down so far? Four or so? Going to be joined by one of the best boxers on the planet, Terrence Crawford. Francis Ngannou will stop by, talk about the Jarzinho win and the call-out. Stefan Struve will react, of course, to what happened Saturday night, the multiple low blows. Diego Sanchez, always a fun time. Focus on 245 with Kai Kara France, who meets Brandon Moreno. Important 125 fight. Alexander Volkanovsky, who meets Max Holloway, and, of course, Aspen Ladd. But first, let's go back to the Skype machine and say hello to the man who will meet Dan Hooker in February in Auckland, New Zealand, the great Paul Felder, kind enough to join us via his car. Paul, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining. I, I appreciate you coming on. You're such a big shot these days on TV, all over the place, traveling the world. I feel like you're a little too big for us. Not at all, man. Come on. This is the show to be on. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, first, let me ask you about this past Saturday in D.C. That was a very emotional show, and I know it was very personal for you, um, you know, with, with all the talk about Cancer Foundation, personal with your father, D.C., both of you sitting right next to each other. Was that a, a particularly difficult broadcast to be a part of considering how much you know how much of a personal tie you have to that horrible disease yeah um it was one of those things i didn't really know how i was going to react to it but then sitting next to dc who just went through it more recently with his father in august and Stuart scott and and, and everything and just thinking about my aunt who i've lost my first muay thai coach who i also lost to pancreatic cancer the same as my father it was um it was rough, but it, it's good, man. It's good to raise awareness and be a part of that. And I'm glad that the UFC was getting involved the way they did and kind of dedicating that night to it. Uh, so I, even though it was the last show I'm going to call before I go into training camp, I'm glad that that's the note that I got to end on thinking about my father and, um, you know, the, the perfect fuel I need to, to get geared up. So it was a special night. And I thought all of you involved did a phenomenal job, so kudos to you. Uh, I know it was tough, but I, I thought you all did really great and, and hit all the, the right notes as far as trying to talk about it personally, but also on, on, a, on a bigger scale. Now, you mentioned your, your fight coming up. Before I ask you about that, let me just ask you two things about Saturday. Number one, was that an early stoppage in the main event, or do you agree with it? I just worry, man. You know, what would have happened to that man's lip? God yeah. forbid he took a more shots to the face, but it was really close, and I feel horrible for Overeem because he was seconds away from pulling off a, a decision over one of the more dangerous guys that have kind of burst on the scene in this division. So yeah, it might have been might have been a tad early, considering that you know Rosenstrike walked away. He he should have went in, and I feel like Big Dan would have definitely jumped in, and it might have only been a second left. But if he even looked like he was going in for another shot, I feel like it would have ended. But since he kind of gave him that space. I feel like he should have just let Reem stand up, and even though he was hurt, he could have walked away with that decision. But that lip, oh, man, look at that thing. Horrible. And what about, speaking of Big Dan, what about how he handled the Struve-Rothwell fight? He shouldn't have given him that advice, right? I mean, that's, that's unacceptable as a referee, correct? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. We talked about it on the broadcast. Uh, you can't let a fighter know. I think you're winning. That's <laughs> your job. Your job is to say, here's how much time is left in the round. Here's how much time you have on stoppage time to, to recover from the groin strike. You can't influence that. And, you know, that whole thing was, I, I don't think any of it was intentional. It's all unfortunate. I feel horrible for Stefan Struve. And Big Ben's just trying to do his job, and it slipped up. And, you know, he lost the point, and that's what you have to do. But as far as Big Dan, he should have said, listen, I'm taking a point. That's all he needs to know. That's all that that fighter needs to know. It's up to him if he can, you know, continue on in that fight it's not the ref's job to say eh i think you're up yeah it has not been a very good uh last few months for big dan but uh hey uh, we'll hear from stefan later on in the program now let's talk about you is it true that you went to auckland for 24 hours to do the promotional stuff with dan hooker and then flew back home that can't be right i mean th this stare down i, I want to ask you about this specifically in a second but is it true you went there for 24 hours 
Uh, it was a little more than 24 hours. So I, I flew in, I guess, a little before 8 a.m. their time in Auckland. Uh, went right into media, had uh, phone interviews, on-camera interviews, a whole bunch of stuff um, on their Tuesday, our Monday. And uh, Wednesday morning is when we did all this stare-down stuff and, and more media and more photo op. And then I left at 8 p.m. that night. Oh, my gosh. Was it exhausting? Yeah, it was ex- uh, extremely exhausting, but it's exactly what I wanted and I need it, man. That that uh, talking about the fight and having that stare down with Dan just motivated me to get back home and get the training and, and getting this uh, training camp started. You know, I, that got me pumped up. Now, what about that stare down? What did you make of it? I thought it was great. You know, um, that's not my style normally be aggressive but when somebody's going to confront me the way that he did and kind of have his hands down and and get in my face and i'm the type of guy i'm not going to go out of my way to talk trash or demean you or do anything like that but i am a fighter and uh, you know i'm a hard-nosed one like that so if you're going to come at me like that with aggression i'm going to come right back in your face i'm not going to back down so i think it's uh i think it's good you know this stuff's for the fans this is to get people wanting to see this fight and i i think me and dan did that i think we got people interested to tune into this matchup now, the stare down got a lot of play, but as far as I'm concerned, and it's something that kind of flew under the radar, he gave you the old shoulder bump there. Did you see that when you guys were turning? We didn't have it on the clip there. Well, I mean, that to me, that, that was touching right there. That was a little bit of a, that was more aggressive than the stare down. How did you feel about that? Hey, man, listen. <laughs> if you've got to resort to that, what's going on in your head? Oh. You've got to shove after a stare down. You know what I mean? I didn't touch him, I didn't put one hand on him, not one finger. You know, I'm going to do all my touching on Dan on fight night, you know, when I'm using my fist, elbows, and knees. I don't look too much into that kind of stuff. It, it didn't bother me. It didn't hurt me, that's for sure. It was sure. a little, little, little extra elbow on the side. So uh, I'll just have to give him one back on the, on the 22nd slash 23rd. Any, any other run-ins with him while you were there? No, I mean, we were around each other that whole day, you know, talking to the cameras and things like that. But he didn't have much to say and and that's fine you know we're we're fighting at the end of the day we don't have to be best friends but i do feel even though you know obviously we got some some blood bo- you know our blood is boiling for yeah. each other right now we want to get in there we are both on the cusp of really moving towards that top 5 and getting a much bigger fight so i think that's where it's all coming from i don't think it's necessarily animosity towards each other but listen we're standing in each other's way to move towards you know a fight that could potentially put us in line for a title shot and of course, this one has like a year history with you being in the cage after one of his wins and him essentially calling you out uh, while you're, you're, you're working as an analyst, which is a fun scene there. You see the, uh, the screen grab from, you. I mean, that's just lovely right there. A little bit of a different uh, mood than the stare down. Have you been impressed with him, though, what he's done in particular this particular year coming off of the Barbosa loss? What have you thought of him? I think he's getting much, much better. You know, his timing is great. He's got knockout power that he's shown. And to take out a guy like Ally Aquinta, who's as tough as they come, you know, that's, that's a statement. That's the one that impressed me. I mean, you know, Vic had been on a, a, a skid. So getting past him, you know, that's not overly impressive. Even though he's tall, he's hard to deal with. But, uh, you know, like that fight there, uh, Dorino Burns, you know, that's, that's a big win. And I think the Ally Aquinta wins are the ones that I'm going to really study and take a look at. Was there any talk of the Bar- the Barbosa fight happening again with all the the aftermath? Was there any talk of that? Not from the UFC. You know, I put it out there that it was something we'd be interested in for five rounds. We wanted it to be a main event. Um, you know, I really hate how all that kind of went down. Uh, it was a, a crazy great fight, and you know, people are talking about all the controversy and all that. Listen, I don't I don't care. That's not my freaking job to judge fights. I go in there, I lay it on the line, and I pressured him. I feel like I was starting to break him in the third round. And if there was, you know, four or five uh, rounds in this fight, it, it, I think it could have been over. But um, I know he's gone on some of the posts about me and Hooker having this main event and putting like crying, laughing faces and things like that. And I don't know if that debt's in or his manager or what it is, but uh, yeah, it's, it's all nonsense. You're a little annoyed at this point of it. You just want to move on. Yeah, of course. I wanted to either move on or have that fight again, but. If I'm given the opportunity to, to take a different matchup and, and switch up who I'm fighting, I'm going to take it. I don't, you know, I'm not dying to have a third fight with that guy. We beat the crap out of each other when we go in there. So, you know, let's take a little break. It's not something that's off the table in the future. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's something that won't happen.
and I'm just curious, I know this is somewhat of a cliche question, but to finally get your first UFC main event, th does it feel any different? That, like, did you perk up when you heard that? I know you're antsy to get back in there and you, you don't like to take a lot of time off, but to hear, wow, you know, like they, you know, you know that they like you, you're on the broadcast team, you don't need that sort of vote of confidence. To be put in a main event spot against a New Zealander, right, a Kiwi in New Zealand, this is a big deal. How did you react to that? I was I pumped out of my mind, man. You know, it still seems uh, not real. You know, as we get closer to the fight and there's more advertisement going on for it, I think it'll set in. But, yeah, I, I was stoked out of my mind. It's something I've been calling for for a long time. But now I feel like I finally deserve it. You know, we've, we've put in a long time in the UFC, five years now. This would be my 14th, 14th fight. Um, I've had a couple co-main spots. I've co-main on a pay-per-view. And I face some of the best guys in this division. And so has hooker at this point so i feel like we finally really put our work in to earn this spot and it was the perfect opportunity people are like you know how do you feel about going down to new zealand and it's like look i don't care it doesn't matter it's five rounds i'm the featured you know we're the featured fighter that night and that's what i want it, it, to get that main event spot is why we do this right i mean we, as much as we want the money and we want the felt to get there you've got to prove that you can kind of headline an event and uh, get people interested in it and at, so at this point, you get by Hooker. Do you feel like you'll finally be in that conversation? Is this is this the fight that gets you to where you want to be, or do you feel like you're still a couple away? I think I'm at least one away for sure at that point. Um, I feel like, you know, we're six and seven if I beat the seventh guy, unless some things in the division really get screwed up uh, and, they're, and they need somebody to step in. You're definitely putting yourself in that spot. You're the guy they're going to call if, if the division is mixed up. But I feel like it sets me up for a huge fight against somebody in the top five, probably another main event or a huge spot on a pay-per-view. And uh, if you get past whoever that is, then I feel like I'm truly in line for, for, a, for a title fight. And at that point, I would be seven seven wins in a row at lightweight minus the, the Mike Perry loss uh, at 170. Yeah. And, and how far in advance, by the way, do you go to New Zealand for the fight to get acclimated? I heard it's like a day for every hour time difference. Are you going to go that far in advance? Yeah, uh, that's what I also heard that, too. I was thinking that. So that would be 18, 19 days for me. That's Gosh. a little far because here's the problem, right? You've got you've to weigh the, the situation here because if I go 18, 19 days out, yes, I'll be 100% acclimated by the time I fight. But I can't bring Duke 19 days out from the fight. He's got a gym that he's running. He's got other fighters. He's got a corner, other people, UFC athletes. I can get him there that whole week. I'm going to go at least 10 days early with a couple of my teammates, get an Airbnb, bring my nutritionist with me, keep my weight on point, keep training hard. Uh, you know, I probably have my last, whenever my last sparring day was, will be, I'll leave right after that. But I, you just, do I go early and lose the training or do I keep the training solid and then, uh, you know, figure out ways to kind of adapt? I've done it before. I've been overseas and fought before. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to figure that out. But I'm thinking 10 days. By the way, congrats on the new contract. How many fights? Four fights. Four. How many were left? One. One. This would have been my last fight on the deal. Okay, so they re-upped you. Are you happy? Hundred percent happy. Yeah, thrilled. Uh, you know, it didn't take long. You know, my manager talked to Shelby, and within a day, we we had this deal. So uh, I, I was um, very impressed, and and um, felt like I was getting taken care of, and they respected what we wanted, and uh, we ended exactly. You know in the situation that I wanted to be. I didn't want to have ex an extensive contract as far as the number of fights because then people don't realize, let's say I go on a good, a good run here. Uh, it's longer before I negotiate. Right. So yeah. the shorter you can keep the contract and get what you want. And uh, then, you know, the chances of renegotiating and have another short contract. And by then, honestly, after this contract into another one, uh, I, I don't see much more. Many more contracts coming my way, Ariel. Right. This is the time, right? This is the time to strike. Yeah, this is it. You know, this contract is, is huge for me as far as setting myself up, uh, making good money, and, and putting myself in the title picture. And then if things don't go that way, uh, we'll see where we are at the end of this contract. But uh, I have no, no problem stepping away from this sport either. Well, so you, you think that this, this is like, it could be these four fights, do or die? Oh, yeah. Oh, easily, yeah. Wow. That's the mindset. That's a lot of pressure to put on oneself. Or you can look at it the other way and it's like, look, this is my chance. I got my contract. I've got the fight I want. I got a main event. You know, things are lining up to to, to get what I want. I've just got to go in there and, 
and pull it off. Right. <laughs> That's the easy part. Go in there and fist fight, right? Uh, it's getting all this stuff and negotiating and getting the main events and getting people hyped about you. That's the hard part, you know, and I put in that time and I've been broadcasting and it's not even because of the broadcasting that I'd be retiring. I know people are saying that, but in April, I'll be 36. And, uh, you know, my whole thing was I hadn't taken much damage. Oh, I hadn't taken much damage. I started my career late. Well, at this point, <laughs> that's not true anymore, is it? Right. Well, uh, you're in a good spot. Uh, hopefully your Eagles have a big victory tonight, Monday Night Football against the... Uh... Can, you, can you believe that we could, we yes. could still possibly win this division? Yes. Like, what happens then? We go, they'll go birds. I'm still going to watch it tonight. Against uh, the hapless uh, Giants. And uh, I know you're still lamenting the fact that you didn't win the Nose World Order Championship back in June. But don't worry, we're still going. And you will get another crack at it, okay? I just want to let you know. Thank God. All right. I've been losing sleep over that one. I know, I know, I heard, I heard. Uh, congrats <laughs> on the new deal, Paul, and, and good luck in training camp. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, as always, Ariel. There he is, the man, Paul Felder. Irish Dragon returns on February 22nd here in the U.S., February 23rd, of course, in New Zealand against Dan Hooker. What a phenomenal main event that is. I am looking forward to it. Okay, how exciting is this? I know a lot of you are excited that this man is joining us on the program. He is 35-0. and 0. He defends his WBO welterweight title this Saturday at Madison Square Garden against Agidius Kavalkas, a.k.a. Mean Machine, December 14th. Same time as UFC 245. He is arguably the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter on the planet, has won at 35, at 40, now at 47. He is the pride of Omaha, Nebraska. He is Terrence Bud Crawford joining us on the program. What a great honor this is. Terrence, how are you, my friend? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm doing all right. You know, we don't usually have pound-for-pound pound greats in boxing joining our little rinky-dink MMA show here, so I'm being honest, this is a great honor for me. Thank you for doing it. I uh, appreciate it, appreciate it. You know, I, I know that you are somewhat familiar with the sport of mixed martial arts, but, you know, I, I want to offer you this, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Your situation reminds me a lot of a guy named Demetrius Johnson in our sport, one of the greatest pound-for-pound pound fighters of all time, but throughout his run as UFC champion, he was always asked... Why don't you get more attention? Why don't you get you know more love from the the, the fellow fighters, the media, the promoter? Why why don't you speak more? Why don't you talk more trash? And after a while, it was just, he was just like, I am who I am. Just take it or leave it. Does it get annoying? Because I feel like every interview you do, you're asked about these same things: the trash talk. Why don't you get more buzz? This and that. And at some points, it's like you're 35 and 0, and you're one of the best pound for pound fighters on the planet. Does that get tiring? That this is the same narrative going into all of your fights? Yeah, sometimes you know. Um you want to be remembered as a person that didn't have to change for anybody. You know, I understand it's an entertainment business, but at the same time, I feel like I'm entertaining in the ring. Uh, I do everything I have to do to uh, put on a great show for each and every one of my fans. And I don't feel like I have to be a certain way to sell fights. That also being said, do you feel like you are starting to get a little more respect now? As I said, being considered one of the pound-for-pound -pound greats, it's essentially you and Lomachenko. Does it feel like people are starting to maybe look past, slowly but surely, all that other stuff, the glitz and glamour, and just be like, yeah, this guy deserves all this praise and he doesn't have to do much more outside of the ring in order for us to give him that praise? Uh, you, have, you have some people that's like that, but... Some people are still like, oh, he's not fighting anybody. He's fighting bombs, or I just don't like him for no reason. So you're gonna you're gonna get a mixture of a little bit of everything. I understand this particular fight is a is a mandatory title defense, but how much of a say <clears throat> do you have in your title fights? Like, do, do you go to top rank? Do you say to them like, please get me bigger names? I need to start fighting bigger names in order to shut these people up. Well, yeah, of course. We didn't sat down and, and talked about who I want to fight and uh, when I want to fight them. But at the same time, I got to get past my mandatory first. And then we got to see how uh, business fall into place in the uh, near future. But my main focus and my main objective is to go out there this weekend and, and get this victory. Uh, it seems like the business of Bud is doing well. I understand you just opened up a, a store in Omaha this past weekend, and there was a great turnout. I mean, is is this all exceeding your wildest dreams? Did you ever think that you would get this popular, especially in your hometown, which I know is a, is is very important to you? It's a big part of who you are. Is it kind of surreal to see how famous you have gotten in Nebraska? 
Well, at the same time, I wouldn't say it amazed me because uh, when I was an amateur, I had a big following in Omaha, Nebraska. Everybody always knew who I was. They supported me as an amateur. And uh, they just been waiting for that moment to come to Omaha so they can really get behind me to support me. And Gamboa was the opening door for all the fans and and the people that wasn't fans that heard of me but, but didn't uh, ever see me fight. They had the opportunity to see me fight live and they became instant fans. And, and it's a blessing that my city, my state, back me the way they do. Uh, like I said, I know you're friends with some MMA fighters. You visited the Ultimate Fighter when TJ Dillashaw was a coach uh, a few years back. How do you feel about MMA? Are you an MMA fan? Of course, of course. You know, I follow MMA. Uh, my my good friend, Masai Bektik, he's from Lincoln, Nebraska. He trained with me on numerous occasions. Uh, TJ came up and trained uh, with me a couple of times, being that he's in Denver, Colorado, and I'm in Colorado Springs. Um, yeah, I like the sport of uh, uh, MMA. You know, I used to wrestle as a kid. My kids is in wrestling. My son is ranked number one in the nation currently right now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I follow it. I'm, I'm curious about your son. As you mentioned, he's doing phenomenally well in wrestling. Is there a chance that he'll go down the MMA path as opposed to boxing, considering how good he is of a wrestler? Well, Actually, he can box too. Okay. You no, know, but I don't want him. I don't want him to do any one of those sports. I don't want him to do MMA, nor boxing, nor football. You know, I feel like I'm making this sacrifice right now for him to do something better with his life and less uh, dangerous. So, you know, he can do whatever he wants. But if you choose to box or choose to go the MMA route then I will support him 120%. Have any of your children said they want to fall in your footsteps? And have you had to have that, that conversation with them that maybe, you know, you're doing this so that they don't have to do it as well? Has that happened yet? Yeah, my older son, the one that's ranked number one in the nation in wrestling, he, he always was coming up to me and said, Dad, I want to box. Dad, I want to box. And I would tell him, like, boxing is a dangerous sport, you know, and he would come to me and say, well, well, you box. You box. <laughs> I, yeah, but I've been boxing since I was seven, and I'm doing this uh, for y'all. I'm making this sacrifice for y'all. And once I told him that people really get hurt in the ring and some potentially die, you know, he was like, I don't want you to box no more, Dad. Like, he started crying. I had to explain to him, like, I, I know what I'm doing in the ring, but at the same time, you never know what can happen. And this was the reason why I don't want him to box. And he understood. It has been a great year for boxing. Um, I'm a huge fan of the sport, but it also has been a tough year for boxing, uh, considering the deaths, especially over the summer and, and most recently with Patrick Day. I know you wrote about him on your social media. When when that happens, do you take a step back? Like, does it make you question the sport and your involvement in the sport? Is it, is it hard to go to the gym the next couple of days after you see, you know, a young up and comer with his whole life ahead of him die because of the sport? Well, you know, it's heartbreaking to see any fighter uh, get hurt in the ring. But at the same time, for me, I think it just drives me more to uh, work even harder to where, you know, those type of things, I could try to avoid it by not getting hit as much or, you know, uh, finish a fight sooner than later, uh, being in the best shape that I possibly can be in. Uh, just try to try to do any and everything that I possibly can to make sure you know, I'm trying my best not to get in a certain situation. And then you have situations like this past Saturday where Anthony Joshua, I think, fights a brilliant fight, a smart fight, a tactical fight, uses his length, his jab, um, doesn't get hurt, and people are hating on him, saying it was boring, saying that he was running. A, what did you think of the fight? And B, what did you think of the criticism that he received afterwards? Well, I, actually, I haven't seen the fight yet because I was uh, too busy in my grand opening at the same time that the fight was going on. But at the end of the day, the sport is called boxing. And if he used his ability and his skill set 
to box his way through a fight against a tough uh, champion and uh, Ruiz, then so be it. You know, you're gonna go. You're gonna get those those fans and those uh, people that say, "Oh, well, that's a boring fight. Uh, he didn't do too much, or he ran." But it's okay, you know. You got the victory. You go home. You can sleep at night. And next fight, you know, you work to put on a better show. Did you hear Ruiz say afterwards that he didn't train enough, that he got too big, 283 pounds he weighed in at? Does that blow your mind that someone will come into a title fight and let himself go? He said he trained alone for this fight. How can that happen? Well, you know, he's he's won the biggest fight of his life. He conquered all his dreams in one night, you know, becoming the champion of the world, uh, beating a champion, all the the glamour, the people behind him, the money. He, he got it all in one night. And some people, they can deal with that, and some people, they can't. And he showed that it kind of got to him a little bit, the partying, you know. Uh, so, hey. Got to come back and go to the drawing board and do better. What has a greater chance of happening in 2020 for you if all goes well this this Saturday? Errol Spence or Floyd Mayweather? Which fight has a better chance, in your opinion? Neither. Neither? They both They both is a 50-50 not to happen at this moment. Is there one that you feel like has a better chance? Floyd says he's coming back, right? Uh, I don't know. Me and Floyd is... That that fight would never happen. I don't I don't believe uh, me and the Errol Spence fight. I really don't know because I don't know his health uh, reasons right now. And I know when he come back to the to the fight game, he's not going to be itching to get right in the ring with me right off of an injury. So I really can't say. Okay. And and what do you make of Floyd flirting with, I don't know if you've seen this, Dana White saying maybe MMA, something. Do, do, you, do you think he'll ever do that? He's not going to do MMA, correct? Who knows? You know, he's Floyd Money, Money Mayweather. You never know. You, uh, you put the right opponent in front of him, he might take it and, you know, he's not going to take it if it's not a smart uh, business move for him. Would you ever do MMA? Uh, I don't, I don't know, man. They don't pay enough. <laughs> yeah. Compared to you guys, right? Like the top guy, the, the equivalent to you in MMA doesn't come anywhere near what the top boxers make, right? Not at all. Right. Why do you think that is? I don't, I don't have the slightest idea, but y'all, y'all guys, you know, y'all take a lot of punishment, getting kicked, you know, choked, elbowed, let alone punched. You know, and I don't feel y'all get paid enough to go through the things that y'all go through. Look at the guy this uh, past weekend yep. that got punched and got his lip split. It's like, dang, all that for what? Ten thousand dollars if you if you show up, and another ten if you win. Uh, I can't do that. Yeah, well, I think he made a little more, but your point stands. They don't make anything. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They don't make anywhere near as much, and it's it's a crazy thing. And now you're starting to see a lot of MMA fighters say they want to come to boxing. Uh, Stipe saying he wants to fight Tyson Fury, and you, you continue to hear this after what happened with Conor. Would you ever entertain that, like one of those MMA boxer matchups, the the super fight, if you will, but in boxing? Of course. Of yeah, course. that's easy for you, like right? I said, yeah. yeah, like I said, you know, uh, it just depends on the fighter and what they bring to the table. And we can get it on if that's what the fans want to see. Last thing for you, um, do you feel at this point like you have anything more that you can do as far as proving people that you're number one pound for pound? Like even a win on Saturday, does that put you ahead of Lomachenko or do you not even care about this sort of thing? Well, my main focus is you go out there and make sure I get the victory. I'm not worried about a pound for pound, uh, number one, in the world, none of that. My main focus is to make sure I go out there and get this victory. Well, I'm looking forward to Like I said, big honor to have you on the show, Terrence. I'm a big fan of everything that you do and what you stand for, especially with your children and your family. Continue to rep Omaha like you do, and good luck to you this Saturday at Madison Square Garden. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, there he is, Terrence Bud Crawford. If you don't know, he is one of the very best fighters on the planet, and in particular, boxer. And... 
he returns to action this Saturday. It's a very busy night in combat sports because we have UFC 245, but also big top rank event on ESPN right after the Heisman Trophy presentation. I have no idea. Who's, who's going to win the Heisman Trophy? Is it uh, Doug Flutie? Who's going to win? Ryan Leaf? Who? Eli Manning? Joe Burrow, LSU. Oh, Joe Burrow. E-A-U-X. Anyway, what a big spot for them to be on right after the Heisman. That's a huge spot for the uh, the boxing card. And so my man Terrence Crawford is is on the card. Also, friend of the program, Mick Conlon, pride of, of Ireland. Remember, he uh, was escorted to the ring with Conor McGregor prior to his debut. He'll be on the pod, I believe, on Wednesday. Is that correct, Corporate Jake? That is correct. Yeah, how about that? Mick Conlon on the card. Also, Tiafimo Lopez. There's the... Uh, there's the, the the poster right over there. And by the way, I mean, and this is a, this is great. I mean, hopefully you'll be able to watch this and also 245. I I highly um, encourage that. And and I hate when people. I get people coming up to me all the time. It's a crazy boxing's dead. MMA is hurting boxing. It's it's the worst take of all the takes. Boxing has had a great year. There's a lot of great up and comers. There's a lot of great stars. There's a lot of great fighters. Terence Crawford, one of them. Lomachenko, another. Canelo having a big victory. Anthony Joshua coming back on Saturday. Of course, Fury and Wilder fighting uh, hopefully in February of next year. And uh, Wilder doing great in his last fight. Fury emerging. I mean, on and on it goes. That fight on Saturday, I thought, was so much fun to watch to see how Joshua handled all the heat after the loss in June against Andy Ruiz, and to see him come back more measured, more calculated, more relaxed, using his distance, his range, using his length to his advantage, not getting caught, not getting into a firefight. This was a great fight. And then afterwards, you see people say he ran. You see people say he was scared. What are you talking about? The only thing that was disappointing about this fight, the only thing was the shape that Andy Ruiz showed up at. 283 pounds, I think it was 18 Above what he weighed in back in June? Come on. And I understand. I get, like, I sympathize. I'm not trying to shame him for it. I sympathize. Here's a guy who no one thought was going to win back in June, shows up, shocks the world. His life dramatically changes. Bentley's, Jimmy Kimmel, famous, pride of Mexico, pride of the Mexican American community here in the United States. I mean, everything changed for this guy. Again, I've said this quote before. It reminds me of the, the very famous Marvin Hagler quote. It's harder to wake up, pound the pavement at 5 a.m. when you're waking up in sand sheets as opposed to sleeping on the floor. Very easy to wake up when you wake up, you know, after a night on the floor. You got nothing to your name. But life changed for this guy. He let himself go. And, and by the way, I actually give him credit for admitting it in the cage, excuse me, in the ring after the fight. Old habit. In the ring, he said it. It didn't do him any favors. He was by himself. He indulged too much. He ate too much. He let himself go. Didn't take it seriously. I actually give him credit for saying it right off the bat, and, and maybe you could view that as an excuse, but I think he was just being honest. I don't have any interest in a third fight. Not right now. And I think that he disappointed a lot of people. I think if he comes in good shape, proper mentality, I think he could do it again. But he wasn't that guy. I mean, the weight discrepancy was great. Joshua came in lighter than the last fight. I thought he fought a smart fight. He did what he had to do. If he would have fought the way he fought back in June, he would have been roasted for that. And it's like, what do we want out of these guys? I get you want to see Rock'em Sock'em Robots all the time. I get you want to see brawls. Those are fun when they materialize. But to go into a fight with that mindset... I don't want to be that guy who's like, you don't understand boxing. Who the hell am I to say that? You don't understand. I don't want to be that guy. But we have to put ourselves in their shoes. What's at stake? You don't play boxing. You don't play fighting. You have to be smart, calculated, measured. And I thought he was that. I thought that was a great fight. It was very entertaining. You know, he had moments where, okay, are you going to see Ruiz come back? Didn't happen. It was great. I enjoyed it immensely. I thought it was a lot of fun. And so boxing is doing great. MMA is doing great. Saturday is a great card. UFC 245. Speaking of weight, by the way, all kinds of drama regarding Jose Aldo's weight, the way he looks, making his bantamweight debut against Marlon Moraes. I weighed in. Connor says he's okay. Darren Till is worried. That's going to be high drama on Friday. Official weigh-ins at uh, 
noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on Friday on, I believe, ESPN Plus. Myself, Brett Okamoto, will be there in uh, in Las Vegas. That one's an interesting one to keep your eye on. How's that going to materialize? I'm also really interested to see how Colby Covington in Las Vegas prior to his first title fight materializes. There's There's underlying tension between Colby and the UFC going into this fight. There's a lot of bad feelings, the way the negotiations went, the things that he has said at the press conference back in November. I haven't looked at my thing here. Okay. There is a, there, there is, there is a lot there. And I'm curious to see, A, how much he participates in all the festivities, the media stuff, all that stuff, and what he says. Because could you imagine a week from today, given the kind of wild card that he is, could you imagine this guy as UFC welterweight champion having all that leverage, holding the gold, having the right set of cards in his hands? That is going to be interesting. Now, you thought Tyron Woodley was a problem. That Stipe was a problem. I don't know if they've ever had a champion that was this defiant. I don't know if it had to be this way, but somewhere along the way it got a little screwy. If he beats Kamara Usman on Saturday, that is going to be a fascinating story to, to watch unfold come 2020. I can't wait for that. That's going to be a fun one. We've got that. We've got Max Holloway versus Alexander Volkanovsky in the co-main for the featherweight title. And, of course, the Amanda Nunes versus Jermaine Durandamy fight. And then the other two fights on the main card, Piotr Jan against Uriah Faber, and then Marlon Moraes against Jose Aldo. That's just the main card. I'll tell you about the rest of the card, but that's a phenomenal card this Saturday in addition to the boxing. So we got a lot to watch Saturday. For now, though, let's say hello to our next guest. He is one of the top contenders in the heavyweight division. He has been in the news as of late with Jarzinho calling him out. Let's get his thoughts on it all. There he is, le prédateur, Francis Ngannou. <laughs> Francis, how are you? I'm good, Ariane. How are you? I'm doing great, my friend. It's good to have you again on the show. I wanted to have you on. I know you were on very recently, but you've been in the news. Jarzinho Rosenstrike continues to call you out. He wins on Saturday, calls you out again. So let's not beat around the bush. What do you make of the call out? Are you interested? I mean, at this point, um, I don't have many options. So yes, I'm interested. As long as I have a fight, I, I'm going to fight. And um, he sounds... He sounds to be a good fight. He makes himself very clear and uh, loud about his desire to fight me. Do you like that? Do you like that there's a guy who's finally being vocal about fighting you? Does this actually kind of excite you? No. To be honest, that's not what really excites me. Uh, I think you guys know that I've been looking for Tyler Short. Um, or calling out Volkov, which is like m way more ranked than... Um, Rosenstroke, but you know, it's not up to me. The UFC, uh, they are not really taking action uh, toward this. You know, like uh, two weeks later, I um, we spoke with uh, with Dana, and apparently we thought things things is going well because they said they're gonna call us in the few day back, and uh, we didn't have that call. Uh, so now we have to call back and ask again, and they keep uh, bringing different options, like, you know. So, so let me ask you about that meeting, because, you know, I've been asking you about this for quite some time. You finally sat down with Dana and the UFC brass. In the moment, were you happy with how the meeting went? As you say, take one more time. Uh, after finally sitting down with them, because I, I know I've been asking you about, you know, your relationship with Dana and not speaking to him. How do you feel like the yeah. meeting went in the moment? When, when you were sitting there, when you left the office um, a couple of weeks ago, did you feel like it went well? Did you feel like you were able to maybe bridge the gap between the two sides? Yes. When, uh, when we left the office, I thought everything was good, and they promised us that they're going to uh, call us. In the, they're going to have a meeting the next day with Mashmaker and give us uh, a call back like next day or two days after. And uh, we have to call back one week after to check, and uh, they keep uh, putting uh, putting us on hold until you know 
until like last week, they will say, okay, let's see what happened uh, between Alista and uh, Rosenstruh because uh, that fight might be a good one. And uh, we were like, okay, if ever Alistair wins the fight, what's going to happen? Like, I mean, we have, we have to have a, um, a, a fact, something will make, something which is like, a, guarantee us a fight, you know, like, not just like um, expecting this, that they tell us that the same thing between uh, for Volkov fight. Like, okay, let's see what's happened in November 9th, if Volkov win the fight, uh, Actually, Volkov wins the win, uh, won the fight, but nothing moves on. So, I don't know. Which fight interests <clears throat> you more, Volkov or Rosenstrike? You know, what interests me more is the title shot. You know <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. But that uh, one isn't yeah, happening, right? I mean, like, yes, because none of those fights, Volkov, either Volkov or Rosenstrike, is not like the fight that is going to get bring me many things. I'm the number two, and I, I'm at some point that I have to call people which is uh, uh, below me all the time. I have to call them out, which is, in my opinion, is a little bit um, frustrating. Yeah, but but did you even ask about the title shot when you met with the UFC? Of course, I asked about the title shot. What they say? But, uh, they said they have the tr uh, they have the trilogy between uh, Stipe and DC, and they don't know exactly what's gonna happen because uh, apparently Stipe is hurt, and they don't know when it's gonna be clear out. So, here we are. And uh, I hope today or tomorrow my manager gonna speak with the UFC and have something uh, clear. You know. Has Has Rosenstrike impressed you? Have you been watching him? And if so, are you impressed with him? Uh, he's doing good. I mean, yes, I was impressed basically by his comeback last <laughs> yeah. last Saturday because that was a comeback. He was losing. He was literally lo lose, losing the fight. Yes, I was impressed that he. I mean, how lucky the guy he is. <laughs> yes, because four second, he was losing the fight, and then before that, I haven't seen no fight that I get impressed of. I mean. I think, to be honest, no, no disrespect, disrespect, but I think I need to see more. Oh. But whatever, if they say so, it's going to be, let it be. What did you think of the stoppage? Did you think it was premature? Yeah, I think so, but I'm not judges. I, I think so because uh, Alistair wasn't out. I mean... He, he stumbled, but he wasn't out. But when you again, I'm not the judges. When you spoke to the UFC, I know you're you're anxious to fight again. Did they say okay, maybe February, maybe March? Did like they give you regardless of opponent? Did they say when? Yeah. Okay, that's one of the most stressful thing because they don't give me nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like uh, I found out that in that meeting, I walk out there with nothing at all. I don't know when I'm going to fight. And that's, that's uh, obviously what I, uh, we went there for. We were like, okay, let's give us something to hold on to because we won't just stay here like uh, in the blind spot. We don't have any uh, sight on anything, you know? Give us something to hold on to. Give us a day. Let's say, okay, we want you to fight in this day, then we will find some opening. We will... Uh, trying to make uh, find a, a opening who makes sense to make you fight on this card on this date. At least I have something, uh, but we didn't have that. They didn't give us nothing. Yeah. Oh my. So I have a, I still have a three fight in my contract, but I I feel like if it has to be like this one, it's gonna be a hell of three fight. And so okay, so you wait, so. They say that they don't have something, but they did also say that they were waiting for France. But now I just heard that the France situation has been delayed, right? So they're no longer waiting for France, right? Potentially waiting for France, but they didn't guarantee nothing. As yeah. I said, they didn't say nothing that we we were uh, uh, walking out there and knowing that, okay, we are going to fight in France, you know? Yeah. yeah. We didn't know that. 
he was just like, okay, you don't, the friend's going to be good, this could be good, but nothing like a fact. What is going on in France? Why did it get delayed, you know? Yeah, you know, there, there is this um, one federation uh, with vying to become uh, the hosting federation for, for the MMA. So he was, uh, he came after a few months after other federation and then he request he requested more time and uh, the minister call, uh, give give them one more one more week one more month and maybe more so do you think it happens in 2020 the, yes because okay. uh, they're going to meet up in february okay uh, actually we are hoping that it's going to happen in february or, or maybe march but the minister said maybe february okay and and so you said you have three fights left on your deal yeah i have three fights left are, are you hoping to just fight those out and then test the market is that the plan now let's see what's happened what's best best now i mean first fight i have a fight that yeah. should be good yeah. just have a fight right at you this know? point you'll do anything you'll take anyone yeah I'm taking anything. And that's what I said. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be uh, stuck in on title shot or whatever. Just give me a fight. I'm willing to fight uh, to fight uh, anybody. Like, let's give me uh, Shamir. Let's give me whoever you want me to fight. I'll just fight. But uh, it's been over five months. I'm here. Mm. Oh, my. Yeah. And and no no end in sight. No no date, no month, no range, no nothing. No, nothing. No clue at all. Oh. Well, at least you have someone who wants to fight you openly, right? Jarzinho. He told us March, April though he wants to return. Is that a little too late for you? Do I have a choice? <laughs> Do they give me something? No. Right. I mean that exactly like I feel like uh, that exactly how the I mean how they want me to feel like to feel low and yes what i don't have nothing else they just put me here in the blind spot they didn't say nothing and just stay in there like whatever i mean yeah let, maybe it, it would be good to fight uh all my three fight to fight out of my of my contract then i might have options because i can't keep staying like this like this the guy fight a fight after another one and then um, he's take his time. Okay, March. He, he might want to fight in March, April. Then I will expect that he's ready to fight at some point, so I can have a fight. Mm. Yeah, that's how. That's how my situation is. You know. Well, I wish yeah, you the I'm best, Francis. I'm sorry that you're going through this. Hopefully, you get that fight sooner rather than later. Maybe against Jarzinho or anyone else. Uh, the Jarzinho fight certainly seems interesting and. I appreciate you coming on and explaining or at least updating us once again on the situation. Hopefully it gets resolved very soon for you. Well, I hope so. That's only, that's only what I get is hope. Yes, <laughs> we have to hope. Francis, thank you. Good luck. <laughs> thank you, Arya. All right. Bye-bye. A frustrated Francis Ngannou. Uh, I think that fight makes a lot of sense. And personally, I think that fight has a little more buzz right now than the Volkov fight. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully they get him a fight soon. Put him on the January card. Put him on the Connor card. Just... Get the guy fight. He's frustrated. So we'll see what happens. And we certainly wish him well and appreciate him coming on. Now let's stick with the heavyweight theme here for a second. A uh, controversial, bizarre fight on Saturday. Ben Rothwell, Stefan Struve. It ends with a loss for Struve, who came out of retirement but was hit multiple times below the belt. And then that bizarre scene that we spoke about earlier with Paul Felder, um, where Struve and Mergliata were talking, and it seemed like Mergliata was, was urging him to continue. Let's talk to Struve now and get his side of the story. He's kind enough to join us via Skype. Stefan, how are you, my friend? Uh, pretty good, if you uh, look at what happened Saturday. <laughs> yeah, physically, how are you feeling right now? Um, it's uh, still a little sensitive down there. Um, it, um, yeah, it is what it is, man. Um, luckily, no, uh, no big damage. So. Okay. Have you ever felt anything like that before in a fight? Uh, not in a fight, and like I've been kicked in the nuts in in training before. Um, the the surprise was like it, it didn't really hurt where you you think it would have hurt, but like the whole area around it like cramped up, like my abdomen and underneath the package. Um, 
it um I, I don't know i think it's just like protection from the body when you get hit there um man it, w- it was hard to like um you know breathe and just get get that loosened up again it, it it took the energy out of me how close were you to not continuing after the first one um I, I was getting ready again after like get, getting close to the five minutes so I, I was i was okay i was good to go um um I was able to refocus um, after that. Um, the second one was um, it, it, yeah, everything was still sensitive then, so like, and it really took my focus away. I'm like, really, you really just did that again? Like, it was um, like, and I don't blame Ben for anything. I told him that I sent him a message. Um, I really don't believe that he did it on purpose. Um, so you know, like, no, uh, no ill feelings towards him, but it. Um, it definitely did change the course of the fight, in my opinion. Um, I was totally in control, um, feeling good. I think I looked um, as good as I have in there. Um, we changed a lot of things, and I, th- I think I looked like a new fighter. Like, he had nothing for me up until those kicks, in my opinion. So it was, um, it, it is very frustrating for me. And, and just to be clear, did he reach out to you first, or did you send him that message just to let him know that you didn't think that he did it on purpose? Uh, we, we talked a little bit in the cage, but I was like super pissed off and like, I didn't really know exactly what I said anymore. I just sent him a short message to be like, Hey, you know, like no, no, no ill feelings at all. Like, I know you didn't do it on purpose. Uh, all the best to you. Um, he sent me a message back. So like, I don't, you know, no animosity there. Yeah. The, just the, the rules and the way that is handled, man, that, that just screwed me in my opinion. And um, I, I was cruising in that fight, man. I felt so good after coming back, and I felt as relaxed as I've ever been. Um, everything was going great. Um, if, I, if I fought the third round like I did the first and the second, I would have won a decision. And, um, yeah, then everything just fell apart. So Now, in addition to the controversial kicks, the moment that is also being scrutinized is the conversation that was picked up uh, via the mics and the cameras between you and the referee, Dan Mergliata, who we see right over there. Did he, in fact, say to you, you know, he, it almost seemed like he was trying to urge you to keep going because he thought that maybe you were up, but if the fight ended in the second round, it would end in a no contest, so you couldn't win after the, the second accidental kick. Did he try to convince you to keep fighting? And, and if so, did he actually convince you to keep fighting? Um, I think, uh, to be honest with you, I think he was just trying to like, like give me info about what was happening. Cause I like, I had no idea, like what was going on with the rules. Um, there's always, uh, like, I, I never really researched that cause I don't think that's going to happen. Right. Right. Um, I don't, I don't think he pushed me. Like he was just trying to like give me info. Like, um, a lot of people are, you know, talking a lot of smack about Dan doing that, but I've always liked him. He, uh, he's refed a lot of my fights, has always done well. Um, he, um, I actually thought about this in the afternoon. Um, the, my, my, um, really bloody fight in Germany, he was the referee and he let me continue at that point, you know? So I really do think he, he meant to the best with what he did. Um, it's very easy to burn someone down like that, you know, but, um, he, he was just, I think trying to keep the fight going and, um, yeah, that's it. Okay, so you feel like the criticism he's receiving is unfair. That even though, I mean, because he shouldn't technically be telling you about the scorecards or if you're winning or not, right? I mean, that's not his position. That's not his role. Yeah, but I, like, I agree, but I, I knew myself that I won both rounds. Okay. Like, I just, like, there was no secret in that because I, I was doing really well. And, um, yeah, no, there was no secret in that, but like I understand that it's not his role. I didn't listen to the the conversations we had. I just watched the fight, the action, um, and um, I didn't watch those those five minutes because it's like I don't want to watch myself rolling on the floor. You know, it's yeah it's horrible. <laughs> Do you recall what your 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 mental state was like after the second one? Okay, you say I'm good to go. And then, unfortunately, it ends shortly thereafter. Like, were you completely out of it? Do you, do you regret, essentially, the decision to say, I'm good to go? Should you have not continued to fight? Um, the pain was uh, was doable. My breathing was um, pretty good under control. Um, but, um, you know, at the same time, Ben had, like, two times five minutes to, to uh, you know, refresh. And he's, like, uh, 
a fighter who was very dangerous in the first round. So he, he pretty much had four first rounds to go at it. Um, kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, I, I really had to refocus after the first uh, shot. I did pretty good with that, especially, uh, you know, after the, the break, after the first round. And um, I really sh struggled to refocus after the second one. Um, then he did really good by blocking one of my leg kicks. That was a really good block that hurt my leg. And, um, yeah, my mind already wasn't there. And then I had that, and, um, he, you know, he came at me, and I didn't react well there. Um, I don't know how much I can blame myself for that at that point. But, um, yeah, it's just super frustrating, man, because you, you obviously obviously seen the fight. Like, in my opinion, this is the best I've looked, and all the changes that we've made were really, really paying off. And then, you know, after such a long time, you decide to fight again, and you do a long camp with all the emotions and all that stuff. And... Looking forward to the week after the fight because um, that's just, you know, awesome when the stress is, is gone. But now there's frustration, you know, like I, I really do feel like I was winning a fight. And it, it then with out of your control, things happen and things are, yeah, things just go completely different. I, I know you recently signed a new contract with the UFC after you, you came out of quasi-retirement. Part of that deal, do you get a win bonus and a show you know, a show money and a win bonus. So in, in other words, did you get deprived of half of your pay? Oh yeah. And, um, yeah, we were talking to the UFC and I was, I'm happy with the new deal, new deal we'll see, we signed, you know, I, I wasn't in a great position because I just only won my last fight. They gave me a good deal. We were talking about a flat fee at first, but we, um, you know, we chose to go with uh, a different deal. Um, yeah, I'm missing a good chunk, a chunk of money. I'm missing six figures if I would have won the, the third round. But at the same time, Ariel, this is MMA and anything can happen, especially in the heavyweight division. Um, I just really feel like I was in control in the, the first and the second round. Um, if you if you rewatch the fight, um, he had nothing. He didn't land anything. I landed everything, front kicks, side kicks, head kicks, low kicks, my jab, my uppercuts. Uh, man, it's just really hard to give it a spot. But... Um, um, I think everybody knows um, a bunch of stuff I've been through in my career, and I, I just want to be positive, man. It's December. Mm. I'm uh, I'm back home. I'm I'm done training for the fight for a little bit. I'm gonna relax with the family, and I'm... what else can you do? I, I just want to clear something up because I I saw some people say like all of a sudden you get all these experts. Oh, he wasn't wearing a cup. There's no way those hurt as bad as 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 they, you know, appear to that it wasn't like, you know, a, a direct blow. Were you in fact wearing a cup on Saturday? Oh yeah, 100%. And um, the, the thing is, it doesn't really matter what kind of cup you have. Uh, I think Ben actually broke his toenail with one of those kicks. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, no matter what cup, you can never tie it so tight that there is not like, a, a, just like a tiny little amount of space when you're moving, right? Because when you're moving, that thing moves a little bit too. So I think what happened with the first one is like his toe snuck through or whatever, and he hit me in a spot where it just really, really hurt. And um, it's just super unfortunate. If you get kicked uh, right, like right on the front of the cup, it doesn't hurt as bad because the cup takes most of the, the you know, the, the hit. But when you get hit on the side, it can really, really hurt. Yeah. It's, really, it's just like a KO, you know, like um, some, some punches are landed and you're like, wow, that guy is still standing. And then... At another angle, you get hit, and someone goes down, and this was kind of like kind of similar, man. And crazy. Do you? Uh, I just want to ask again. Do you regret saying you were good to go after the second one? Do you just wish a no contest is different than a loss? Do you, Do you regret that decision? Um, whatever happened um, after the, the second um, the second low blow happened, man. Like I cannot change anything about it. Um, it's so hard to make a decision at that point. Like, I still got to think about it a little more. Um, either way, man, a loss and no a no contest or whatever it doesn't pay the bills. It doesn't give me my win bonus. You right. know, I, I, con I continued to fight because I knew I would get paid double if I would win. Um, and I felt like I was okay to go. Um, the, the, the thing that really just frustrates me, like, I don't care. I don't really care about the loss, man. Like, it happened. What really frustrates me is that I was looking really good. I did everything we did in training. I had a really good training camp. I felt as good as I've ever felt in the locker room. Everything was so clear. I knew exactly what I was going to do, and I did it. And then out of your control, um, 
two things happen and your focus is just gone and it it just goes south. It's crazy. Are you going to keep fighting? Oh yeah, 100% man. Okay. Next time I'm next time I'm going to go in there, I'm going to show an even more improved fighter um than I did this Saturday. So like that's that's the only thing that counts for me like take out the positives cuz I've watched that fight like 10 times and I'm, when I'm when we were fighting, I'm actually really pleased with what I'm seeing. Like I saw someone who was really, you know, focused, sharp, relaxed, having fun in there. I also I was smiling in the locker room, everything. One of the reasons I retired for from uh, from fighting in the first place because I was so anxious during fight week. Like it felt like I was, you know, not doing myself any favors with it because it was giving me so much stress. And now I had a great week. I was relaxed in the in the in the in the locker room, smiling, having fun. Go in that cage, like barely any nerves. I kick ass, and unfortunate things happen. But it is what it is. I'm sorry, my friend. Uh, it was hard to watch, and uh, just just a very unfortunate and unsettling fight. And uh, to see how it ended after the two low blows, uh, you deserve better than that. And I'm I'm really sorry. You come out of retirement, everything. You've been so open um, with your feelings. I'm really sorry it turned out that way. But I appreciate you coming on and and giving your side of the story. And Hope you have a good holiday season, and we'll see you back in there sooner rather than later, Stefan. Yeah, same for you, my friend. Thank you for having me, and uh, you uh, you have a great December as well, man. Thank you very much. There he is, the skyscraper, right. Stefan Strew. Very unfortunate, and uh, hopefully uh, he, he's able to get back in there relatively soon and, and get back on track. Because, and the one thing that stood out for me, wanted to keep fighting because I get you know the other side of the pay. Uh, one of the main reasons why I've long advocated for just a flat fee and not a, a show. And when you walk in there, you deserve to know what you're getting, in my opinion. All right, let's talk now to one of the legends of this game, a uh, man who really needs no introduction. He's been in the UFC longer than anyone at this point. Ultimate Fighter Season 1 just re-signed with the company and is returning in his home state of New Mexico on February 15th in Rio Rancho against Michel Pajeda, the one and only, the incomparable Diego Sanchez on the program. Diego, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Ariel? It's good to, good to hear from you. Yes, and congratulations on the new deal. Yeah, uh, were, are we were you, can you not hear me? Am I having problems? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. No? You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, because it's just like, it's like I'm getting some static going through the line, but go oh. ahead. Let's do this. Do you want us to call you back? Is it? Is it? It's like, the, like yeah, there, there's, like a, there's like a delay even on... I can hear you, so let's go. Okay. Um, you recently signed with the UFC after announcing that you were no longer under contract. Were you worried that your tenure with the company was going to come to an end before getting this deal? Um, absolutely not. I wasn't in a state of fear in any way. I, you know, I, I love what I do, and um, I, I, I believe that I have a value for the company UFC with all the experience and just everything I've given to this company, I, I, was, I was happy to resign, but I was also ready to, to walk if I had to walk. And, you know, it's just uh, my path of life is back in the UFC, and I'm excited to continue this mission that I'm on. And I have a heart full of passion, and I'm just excited to go in and fight in front of my hometown. After the case of fight, did you consider retirement? Oh, not at all. The Kiesa fight, you know, that was just a, a bad night, man. Um, I'll make my, pe my peace with the situation. It was just a bad night. I was out till the Hall of Fame ceremony. Like, I mean, adrenaline dumping. I mean, achieving a lifetime achievement award. And I, I was hardly getting out of the hotel, trying to get back in my car, get back to the, to the New York, New York by 1 o'clock, eat dinner. By the time I'm in bed, it's 3 in the morning. I'm like... All right, uh, let's meditate. You know, like I can't sleep. I'm, I'm like, I'm all charged up. I'm like, let's meditate. The night before that was a weight cut night, so nobody sleeps good before the, the night before weight, the, before you're about to weight cut some weight. So, it's one of those things. It was a rough night, and you know, I didn't get beat up. I didn't get knocked out. I didn't get finished. And Michael Kess is a dangerous man. You know, you look what he did to to Carlos. He finished him rather easily and he had me in some very dangerous positions and I was able to masterfully escape. 
Uh, so in hindsight, do you regret the Hall of Fame decision? Essentially, like you wish that was happening, not on a week that see, you were that, fighting? That, see, that's, that's the thing. You know, it's a sweet but sour bite to swallow. Yeah. It, I can forever have that little thing on the side of my name that says Hall of Fame, UFC. And I had to make a decision. I wasn't in the sensory deprivation tank like I usually am before every fight. You know, I'm resting, I'm, I'm meditating, I'm visualizing. Uh, I was just riding the wave, and, and I had the idea that I was going to ride the positive energy, man. That I was just going to, you know, keep that positive energy all the way to the next day. And, you know, it is what it is. No regret. I'm a Hall of Famer now. You know, Michael Chiesa, I take my hat off to him. He's a great fighter. You know, if I ever get a dance with him again, it would be fun. And I would let my hands go different, and it would be a different story. But... You know, it is what it is, and now it's on to Michelle in Albuquerque, Rio Rancho, February 15th. Yeah, and uh, you certainly deserve that Hall of Fame nod, so I hope that you don't have regrets about the, the induction. I'm curious, though, uh, there was so much drama before that fight about leaving Jackson Wink. Now, several months yeah. later, where are you at as far as your team, uh, coaching staff? What's the latest? Right now, where I am, um, you know what? I, I'm a private mixed martial artist. I, I, I work for myself, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't go in there with a bunch of teammates. And so right now what I'm doing is I'm working with my trainer and my mentor, Joshua Fabia, and um, we're, we're training every day. We're in the boxing gym. We're in the jiu-jitsu gym. We're, we're doing what we got, what we got to do. We, we have a plethora of friends and and just people who would love to train with Diego Sanchez learn some of my natural anti-aging some of my ant outside the box methods you know these outside the box methods are amazing and I'm representing school of self-awareness now and I believe in this so much that I am teaching I'm teaching every Wednesday night at enlightened enlightened wellness center and um, I'm teaching breathing movement and some self-defense, and some healing, and um, I, I, it's more than fighting. Fighting is one thing. Fighting is only a platform for me to use, build a following, and, you know, I can give these people that have had my back in my, my warrior career, you know, give them back something, you know, good health, state of mind, you know, how, how is Diego able to recover from all these traumas? Because, Many people out there in the world have traumas, different type of traumas, not necessarily traumas to the head, you know? People have traumas, emotional trauma, that they never get over. And I'm, 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 I'm a perfect example of, I've gone through so much. This last year was the hardest year of my life going through a divorce. But through this fire, I was cleansed. And I truly found myself outside of the identity Diego Sanchez, the UFC fighter. This is all I ever knew. This is all I was ever told, taught. So this was my life. And I've had a real chance to find someone special in my mentor, Joshua Fabia, who, who's guided me in, you know, finding myself. And now I'm living for more than just the purpose of fighting. And I'm taking every day and enjoying it with, with gratitude and grace. And, uh, you know, life is good. You know, like, look at me. I, I, mm -hmm. I look good. I feel good. I'm, I'm living a good life, living my dream. And, you know, whether it was going to be in BKB, you know, taking the gloves off because, you know, I never really cared for gloves anyway. Yeah. But whatever I was going to do, go over over to 1FC. There was a lot of other options outside of UFC. I love UFC and I love the brand UFC and I love being a part of this company. But... I, I, I got, for the first time in my career, I had the chance to go establish my value, not just be told, this is your value. Mm. And, you know, so I, I got I to gotta work with, I got to work with some angles and, you know, say, you know what, I'm, I'm Diego Sanchez. You know, I, I am, I am special and I am worth, you know what, I might not be ranked in the top 10, but I, I bring something very special to the organization and to the octagon every time I go to battle. And by the way, is, is Joshua your lone coach? Like when you fight on February 15th, will he be the only man in your corner? You know what? He is my lone coach, but hey, uh, shout out to Mike Tyson right now. If you want to work my corner in the next fight, I would love to have 
the legend Mike Tyson in the huh. corner. If you ain't doing anything, February 15th, OG Diego Sanchez <laughs> needs a cornerman. Okay. You know? And then we could do the hot box after. All right. Do you know Mike? Have you ever met him? No, nah, I never met him. Well, actually, you know what? I did meet him long, long, long time ago. It was it was long before all this stuff okay. happened. And it was in the start of my career. I'm sure he probably hardly remembers. But um, no, I met, I met Mike. I, I hope he remembers. He, he told me, like, you know, hey, Diego, you know, don't be doing the party and it ain't going to get you nothing. And at the time that we were at a, at a hotel pool party oh. in Hollywood. And man, he was huge. He looked like a dinosaur at that time. He must have been like 300. He was just giant, gigantic. And he was just walking around and it was like being so cool and, and loving to me. But um, I, it's been a long time. I wonder if he remembers. I'd like to ask him. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe he will corner you. Uh, by the way, why do you refer to your coach, Josh, as, as a mentor as opposed to like a coach, a head coach? Why me- You don't hear this term. A lot in in uh, the fight game. Why mentor as a, as opposed to head coach? It's because Ariel. What is fighting? Maybe one percent of an entertainment industry, man. You know, it's entertaining people. There's some things that are so much more priceless and valuable than fighting. And Joshua has been able to show me, you know, just the different appreciation in a course of life and you know taking me to the middle east i was in jordan for three weeks in the oh. holy land barefoot walking the holy land barefoot doing things different outside the box going in the dead sea meditating in the dead sea even in the middle of the night You're like you know it's it's just it is truly outside the box i have found someone that that embraces the the the, the diego weirdness and and equally can guide me in 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 a, in a positive direction. So, How did you meet? You know, it's it, you know the universe brought us together. How <laughs> else? You know, you know, random meeting, random meeting, and and the guy's like, well, I could show you some stuff, and I'm like, okay, um, well, you know, you never know which you never know what you're gonna learn from anybody, and I was like, well, you know, what the hell? Let me see, let me see what you got, little guy, and. He showed me this one move that like snaps the arm. And I was like, I was like, well, wait a minute. I could actually like, this is like, this is legit. Like I, I, I could use this. I could really hurt someone with this. And I put him in my phone, Josh Armbreaker, Fabia. <laughs> and he's still in there. He's Josh Armbreaker, Fabia. I didn't know he was a, I didn't know he was a guru or a mentor, or, you know, all this other stuff at the time. I thought he was just some, some, wow. some little guy that, you know, was awesome offering some type of uh you know massage therapy healing to me after being much much more after what happened in july did 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 anyone from jackson reach out to you to try to make amends or did that not happen well the manager has contacted me and would like me to to go on in and, and make things right with the coaches but at this point there is no reconciliation on my point it's just it's a conflict of interest at this at this time. Okay. You know, I I I I love all the fighters in that gym. A lot a lot of the young guys that I I, I got to really connect with. You know, bleed, sweat, cry with those guys. But you know, I wish them the best. And it just wasn't the right situation for me. And um, I've moved on moved on to something that 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 is better for me. Okay. That is just just truly truly better for me. I'm growing, and I'm very very excited to show all of this uh, this wisdom of technique that has been passed on to me you know because in my last fight it was not not a true showing i, I you know i didn't have a, a training camp the last three weeks i i didn't have a team and you know i i went out there with the mindset i was going to go and strike up michael Chiesa. it went there was some things that happened but it didn't go my way and i didn't get the job done i didn't execute the game plan and that's all there is to it I learned from it. I'm going forward and I'm never, ever going to go in there and not pull the trigger again. I'm going in with the full clip and all 100 of these bullets. That's it. Uzi time. What do you make of Michel Pajera? He has received some criticism for his antics before the fight, 
walking to the cage in the fight, and then he lost in his last fight to a relatively unknown fighter at the time, Tristan Connolly. Uh, he's also a very big guy, missed weight. What, what do you make of this individual? And, and when you were presented with the matchup against him, what did you make of it? You know, Michelle is young, hungry, experienced. Um, you know, he comes from, comes from Brazil. He, I, I'm expecting him to really put a lot of work in his weight cut, his conditioning to, you know, you know, just make up for that, that failure, you know, that he, you know, and, and I know about failures and I, I've fallen before. And uh, right now he's um, in a place of loss and he wants to prove to the world that he deserves in the UFC. And he's got this big fight with me. So I'm sure he's going to bring everything he got. For someone who has ripped the, the you know, 505. I, 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 I respect him. I respect him. But, you know, like, dude, go ahead. Let's, let's throw some cartwheels. You want to see a cartwheel? I'll show you a cartwheel. Real quick. Oh. I'll well, throw a yes cartwheel like that. <laughs> <laughs> you are the innovator of the, uh, the cartwheel. Will, will you try to counter his, his antics? Is that what you're saying? You're, you're going to try to outshine him in there with, with, with all the theatrics? If he, wants to, if he wants to have a cartwheel off, we'll have a cartwheel off. Like, <laughs> like, like I've been working on my backflips. I got a somersault. You know, I could do a 360. <laughs> uh, you, you don't want to see my tornado attack, Ariel. It, it's it's gonna it's it's gonna shock the world. All right, I like it. Um, and what about getting an opportunity to fight in New Mexico? You you've been repping New Mexico for so long. You're so proud of where you're from. To get a fight like this in New Mexico, that had to be special, right? Yeah, it really was. It was just uh, the universe respond responding in so many ways, like because. Either I was going to fight a fight in BKB here in Albuquerque oh. in March or, or, or UFC here in Albuquerque. So it just like it worked out like, you know, and UFC, they resigned me and took care of me. And um, I'm, I'm happy to be with my, the company that, you know, like like no one else can say I was with this company when they were 40 million dollars in debt. Can anybody else on the roster say that? No. Like anybody? Like no. maybe Sean Shelby? Like that? Like maybe Sean Dana? Well, like they're not even fighters. Even owners weren't there. Right, you know? right, 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 right. Like, yeah, I know. Not, but I said on the well, on the roster as far as even people working for the company. Okay, okay. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's yeah. a crazy thing. Your longevity is unbelievable. Um, and now here you are. You signed. How many fights, by the way, is this new deal? Five fights. Do you think this is the last one, or you're not even looking at it that the way? Last one. The last run, uh, the last run in the UFC. I don't know. Um, I'm I, I'm taking life one day at a time, living it moment for moment, appreciating every single human being that comes in my path, and you know that I'll go from there. You know, I, I got everything I need. I'm 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 well taken care of, set for life, and so I'm doing this for the passion of the platform. The passion of the platform is is why I fight, because these people that I connect with and that follow me, after I'm done with my fighting, I'm going to be able to pass all of my wisdom and knowledge in this, what I'm doing, this natural anti-aging and as school of self-awareness worldwide. And, and, and just, you know, my path after fighting is, is, is full, of, full of gold. You know, I, I know that my future is blessed outside of fighting and I'm going to do these, these last five fights in the UFC and go from there. You know, we'll see, you know, it's going to be what, two years from now. Yeah. We'll see where I'm at. going to be 40 years old. So if it's time to hang it up, it's time to hang it up and, and take my fight outside of the octagon and doing things like working with Olvad, which is a company that takes recycling. It, it recycles all of the, the trash out of the ocean, the styrofoam, the plastics, turns it into a material that you could build houses with that is fire retardant and mold retardant. And so there's, there's some really good things. And if you are interested in finding out about any of the Diego Sanchez stuff, the School of Self-Awareness, all this, we're, our YouTube is about to launch. We have over 200 hours of episodes and outside the box stuff like in the Dead Sea and and nature and going into like just what we're doing, what we're doing. And it's it's deep. It's deep. It's very deep, Ariel. It is the abyss. Okay. We shall leave it at that, Diego. Congratulations 
on the new deal, my friend, and I'm very happy for you that you've re-signed, that you're happy, and that you're getting this opportunity to fight in your home state, which I know means a lot to you. Thank you so much to you, and thank you to Josh as well, and good luck to you guys as you prepare for this big fight against Michelle Pajeda. Thank you, Ario. You have a great one. Same to you, my friend. There he is. The one and only Diego Sanchez, truly a uh, legend of this game, Hall of Famer now, and uh, one of six fighters in the history of the UFC with at least 30 UFC fights on his resume, six most at 30. Unbelievable that he has fought at least once in the UFC every year since 2005. He is currently the longest tenured fighter on the roster. Ultimate Fighter Season 1 middleweight winner back in April of 2005. Won two of his last three, but the fight against Michael Chiesa didn't go his way. Back in July, he gets an opportunity to get back on track with the new contract on February 15th. All right, let's turn our attention back to UFC 245, and let's zero in now on maybe the team of the year. City Kickboxing has had an unbelievable year, of course, led by Israel Adesanya, Dan Hooker, but what a night they can have on Saturday with Alexander Volkanovsky fighting against Max Holloway for the featherweight title and also Kai Kara France making his American uh, pay-per-view debut, if you will, on the card as well against Brandon Moreno. Let's say hello now to Kai Kara France who joins us via the magic of Skype. Kai, how are you? Good, bro. How you been? I, I'm doing really well. What a big opportunity this is, not only for you and the, the whole team to really finish a dream year on the right note. And you've never fought. I know you fought on the Ultimate Fighter um, in America, but never you know, officially on one of these numbered cards, pay-per-view cards. For you to get this opportunity in Vegas on the same card as your friend and training partner, Alexander Volkanovsky, fighting for the belt, what was your reaction when you got this opportunity? Oh, it's pretty surreal. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. I guess it's rewarding. Um, having the UFC see potential in me and uh, want to get behind me and um, yeah, putting me on these big cars like this. So um, it's been a great camp having Alex fly over from Sydney um, to finish his camp off with, with us at uh, City Kickboxing in Auckland, New Zealand. And um, yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been a good camp pushing with each other. You know, we can, um, he's a good sparring partner for me. He's only two weight classes above. So, um, yeah, it's been great having him there, and, and now it's fight week, so all the work's done. Um, it's been a great year for us at City Kickboxing. I think we're 10-0 and 0 this year in the UFC, about to make it 12, so um, we're going to finish this year off the, the right way, and I, I can't wait to just get in there. Now, I know initially you were somewhat campaigning for the Sergio Pettis fight, and it seemed like you got the Pettis fight, and then they find out that his contract had expired and he ends up leaving. Were you disappointed about that and then eventually getting Mourinho? Like, did it feel like a letdown at all after getting the fight that it seemed like you wanted? Yeah, it's just one of those things, you know. You can't be too invested in, in your opponents. Um, it would have been great fighting Sergio Pettis. You know, I fought his cousin, um, Elias Garcia. So I knew he, wa he wanted to get that one back when it's family. Um, but, you know, if these things happen, he's he's uh, opted free agent and now he's in Bellator. So uh, good on him. Uh, but now I've got Brandon Moreno. We've got history there, being both on Ultimate Fighter season 24. Um, you know, I've only got good things to say about him, but he's number five in the world. I'm number six, so he he's in my way. So um, yeah, it's it's going to be a great matchup. He he he's a fun fighter to watch, and uh, I'm expecting him to bring the fight to me come um, next Saturday, uh, December 15th or December 14th. Yeah, the 15th, of course, in in New Zealand. Did you have a relationship? With Brandon, when you were both living in the tough house, I uh, oh, he didn't really know too much English um, back then, so there was a little bit of a language barrier. But you know, he was a nice guy. I just always remember him being on the pool table, always hogging it. <laughs> um, uh, but no, he was it was a good dude. Um, so it, it was it was it was crazy how um, he got his UFC contract because he he was ranked number sixteen and then he lost against the number one guy. Um, Alexander Pantoja, and then he got a last-minute call-up uh, for a UFC fight and won by first-round guillotine. So that just goes to show that you know you can't count this kid out. He he's a gamer and um, he's got the skills to back it up. So um, I haven't taken this fight lightly at all. Um, I've been you know working ten weeks towards um, this fight card, and um, I've put, I've put everything into this. So uh, I can't wait to just get in there, get in there and show the UFC in America the best the best car yet. And, and, and by the way, when did you actually arrive in Las Vegas? Uh, me and Alex arrived Saturday, Saturday lunchtime. 
how how are you acclimating to the the time zone difference yeah i'm all good now i just had to get a good night's sleep but uh i feel good feel sharp already and um the weight's where it should be so everything's kind of smooth sailing it's cool to have all my team out here um i think it, oh izzy just got in last night brad riddell's here um eugene gets in tonight so we've got um, a full squad out here so it, it's nice to have this the support and then the rest of my family get here um later on in the week so um yeah no it's good to have everyone come over can you describe what the mood is like at, at the gym these days you know with izzy doing what he did a couple months ago in melbourne uh dan hooker doing what he did on that card brad riddell as you mentioned uh you guys are undefeated this year eugene is getting a lot of attention for perhaps coach of the year and now you can end it with Volkanovski winning the belt and of course you on the card as well like are, are you guys just riding high this little small gym in Auckland New Zealand so far away what is the the vibe like in the gym as you all are doing so well these days the vibe is it's it's a unique feeling you know because we've known we've been doing this for um the last three four years but it's only now been um I guess drawn into the spotlight so it it, it is nice to get I guess the recognition but you know, it doesn't really change too much. We're just be, we're just gonna keep doing what we've been doing, and and that that's just uh, rolling on to the next year. You know, with this UFC card coming to Auckland, February twenty third. Um, we've got guys training for that right now, so that, that's kind of how the gym works. You know, you you go to your fight, you come back, you give back your body and your time to the next person that's got a fight. So it never really finishes. It's just continuous, and and that keeps us, I guess not too complacent on um, what we've done. And um, even, you know, Israel, after he won the belt, he had it out for two weeks and then he put it away. And that, that's just the kind of mindset you got to have, always striving to be better. And that, that comes from our head coach, Eugene. He's always, I guess, trying to get the best out of us. And, and um, you know, we need to be pushed out of our comfort zones. And, and uh, that's what he's really good at doing. He's good at, uh, I guess, customizing how to motivate someone because you know not everyone's the same everyone's got different personalities everyone's um triggered in different ways so um yeah it, it's a great place to be but um there's there's a lot of work that's required but um you know we're willing to do that and we're willing to make all these uh sacrifices to make sure that come find out where we're more than ready to to go wherever the fight goes and to go to those dark places you know in, in, the, in the third or five round fight where um it, 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 the work's all done you just need an, and whoever wants it more and um and our trainings that we do at city kickboxing we get to those places where um you know people aren't really familiar with but we we try and embrace it and and try live there is the hope get by brandon and fight on that auckland card in a little over two months is that what you want uh ideally you know i don't want to look too far ahead i don't want to look past brandon but Ideally, yeah, I'd love to do both. I'd love to back it up back to back. Ten weeks turnaround. I've done three fights in seven weeks, so um, I've done those quick turnarounds before. Um, and it'll be cool to be on the same card as Dan. You know, me and him started our careers together, um, and for him to headline is amazing. So, um, yeah, obviously I don't want to look past Brandon, but ideally, injury wise, then um, we get we get the win against Brandon come UFC um, UFC 245 in Vegas. Um, I'd love to have a quick turnaround and do it again. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if beating Brandon's a massive fight. He's number five in the world. So there, there's not many guys in front of me. And at the moment, I'm on an eight-fight win streak. So I don't think there's many guys in the flyweight division doing that. Can you explain your, your record to us? Like, if you look at your record, um, in, in 2016, you ended the year... 12 7 and 1 one no contest 12 and 7 coming off a a a loss since then you have not lost you've gone on this amazing streak you're now 20 and 7 with one no contest what changed after that like 12 and 7 somewhat of a pedestrian record and now you're virtually you know unbeatable what what changed um so i was actually living in thailand for about 4 years um and then i uh was on ultimate fighter season 24 um I had a knockout on the uh, only knockout on that season. Um, I didn't get a contract, but then I opted to sign with uh, Ryzen. Um, I, I had a tough fight. I, I, I learned a lot of lessons that night, um, and, and I lost. Um, and then after that, I had to kind of reevaluate what I wanted to do with my career. I knew I was, you know, I knew I had the skill set to be um, one of the best, but 
um, I just wasn't, I guess, performing like I sh- like I usually do in training. So um, I opted to go back to New Zealand and, and train under um, Eugene Berman at City Kickboxing. Um, I, I sat down with him and I said, you know, how am I how am I going to get my career back on track? And he said, just turn up the training and the rest will take care of itself. So, you know, that was back in um, end of 2016 when he said this to me, and I uh, I've just I guess trusted the system and and trusted Eugene and and um, listen to everything he said. So here we are now, ranked number six in the world, eight fight win streak. Um, we we're fighting around, you know, China. We we're fighting in in um, Australia. We we're taking fights wherever just to kind of get more experience. And it was kind of a blessing in disguise. I didn't get signed after the Ultimate Fighter because it had time for me to kind of mature, um, not just you know as a fighter but as a person. And and um, and now I'm 26 years old and and making these big fights in, in Vegas and stuff, it, it's not really, um, you know, overwhelming or um, it's not going to be a shock to me just because in my fight career, you know, I've, I've done already quite a lot and I'm only 26, but um, I could be fighting in a bar or, or in, a, in a backyard. It doesn't really matter. It just um, these experiences get you ready for what was to come. And, and um, Eugene's really good at, you know, getting, getting you ready for these big fights and, Having him just been in a big fight with Izzy um, for the title in front of 60,000 people, um, there's nothing that's really going to phase our gym or, or um, our, our team. So um, that gives me reassurance um, knowing that, you know, they've been in these places before. They know uh, how to, I guess, keep me calm and keep me um, on track. And, uh, yeah, so here we are now, eight fight win streak. Um, in the best shape of my life and uh, ready to put a show on for the American fans. If they saw me on Ultimate Fighter, they saw a, a taste of what I can do. Um, I'm a lot, you know, I'm a lot better since uh, back then. So, yeah, I can't wait to just kind of get in there and um, and show the world what I can really do. Now, I know a couple of months ago you, you spent some time with Henry Cejudo. You posted a bunch of photos of him uh, and you squaring off. Um, playfully on on your Instagram, there's there's one of the videos right over there. What do you make of Henry Cejudo, and do you think that he will ever come back and defend that 125 title? Yeah, old Henry, eh? Um, <laughs> nah, he's a good. Dude. Um, we've got a good relationship. You know, he's kind of taken this mentor role um, with me because he's seen how you know how I've developed over the time. Uh, we lost Kai there. I was uh, curious. To, he just said that uh, Henry's taking a mentor role with him, uh, which I did not know. I thought that they were just buddies hanging out uh, at maybe a promotional event or two. So I'm curious to hear him expand on that. We shall reconnect with Kai Car France. Again, he's won eight in a row, uh, one of the rising stars at 125, 3-0 and in the UFC, coming off a unanimous decision victory over Mark De La Rosa, and you saw the video. Okay, let's go back to uh, Mr. Kaikar France. There he is. Uh, you mentioned he's taken. He's a mentor of yours, Henry Cejudo? Uh, I just mean in the, in the way that um, how we, um, our relationship, it's not that we won't, you know, one day I'd love to fight him, and he okay. said that to me. He said, you know, come to me and, um, you know, Get, keep climbing the rankings and then eventually, you know, come for my title. Um, but from what he was saying in Melbourne, I, I don't think he's going to come back to fly. He said, you know, I'm getting older, I can't keep doing these big weight cuts. So, um, yeah, he, he, he kind of was hinting he was going to stay at bantamweight. So that leaves the division, I guess, wide open with um, with Henry. Uh, sorry, Joseph Benavidez being the number one contender. But, um, you know, there's not really a clear cut um, contender to, um, to fight for the interim title. So, it's gonna be um, it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of happens to the division. Yeah, uh, the, for a minute there earlier this year, we thought the division was gonna go away. It seems like he's saved it, but maybe he doesn't come back. So hopefully they don't get rid of it. It's still wide open, and there's fighters like you who are able to make a name for themselves. We also showed that video um, of you presenting Brad Riddell with the contract. One of the great videos of this past year after your win in China. Was that your idea or was that something the team came up with as just a special way to give him the contract before 243? No, that was all Eugene. Eugene, um, got the deal done when I was, um, in my fight for in China in Shenzhen. Um, yeah, they were working on that deal and he said, you know, this would be a great idea for you to kind of give back and, and Israel did the same with me. You know, he helped me get a contract um, 
when I first made my debut back in 2018 in Adelaide. So it was kind of nice to be in the same shoes and, and to give another teammate um, a contract. So wow. it's kind of like full circle, but yeah, it's an amazing thing to see someone's dreams come true right in front of you and, and to think that you're a part of it. So, um, you know, Brad's, he, he, he's been in my, he, he's been a, um, a good teammate of mine and I've known him for years now. We used to train together in Thailand. So it's, it's nice to both be back at, back in Auckland at City Crip Boxing training together. And um, to see him make his UFC debut back in Feb- uh, sorry, back at UFC 243 in Melbourne and went by the night. Um, yeah, it was an amazing thing to watch. And, and um, I can't wait for the future for that guy because he's one of the hardest hitting guys at our gym, um, pound for pound. The guy's a beast. So, yeah, he's, he's got a big future. Wow, there is something really special going on at that gym. I just love everything that you guys are doing, including something like that. By the way, uh, your your name is is a somewhat unique one. Could you tell us what is the 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 origin of it? Is it is that a is that a Kiwi name, Kai Car France? Where is it from? So Kai is actually my it's it's just a nickname, I guess. It's not my full name. Um, Kai Fare is my full name, um, and then Kara France is my last name. So my mom and dad's last name put together. So. That's why it's, I guess, it's a lot easier for people just to say Kai because they don't really know how to pronounce my la, uh, the second part of my first name, um, Fade. Uh, but the origin of that name, um, so my mum gave that name to me and it means house of knowledge. So um, I guess it's it's quite fitting. It, um, it was named by, um, I'm named after my uncle. So um, yeah, it's a Maori name, uh, native from New Zealand. So. Um, when I step into the, the octagon, you know, I, I, I represent New Zealand, but I represent um, um, Te Reo Māori as well, which is um, the native people of New Zealand. Wow. And and could you spell your, your real first name for us? Yeah, K-A-I-W-H-A-R-E. So in New Zealand, the F sound is W-H. Oh, okay. But you, you don't mind Kai? No, it's just a lot easier, and, and you know, everyone recognizes that name so it's easy to go like that all right well i'm looking forward to your uh your american pay-per-view debut so to speak uh, again i know you fought on tough but this feels like uh, a coming out party if you will you've you've done great as of late and i know this is a big spot for you and the team so all the best to you kai good luck on saturday and uh, all the best to the team as well appreciate your time bro thanks for finally having me on your show absolutely we'll do it again soon there he is kai car france going up against brandon moreno on Saturday on the prelims, UFC 245. Let me take a quick look at the schedule here, the lineup here, if you will, with the main event, of course, being Kamaru Usman against Colby Covington. The bad blood will spill over in the octagon. This fight is phenomenal for the welterweight title, 15-1 and one against 15-1. and one. No love lost between those two. Undisputed welterweight championship on the line. Of course, Amanda Nunes, who we spoke to earlier on the program, going up against Jermaine Durandamy. A rematch. Six years in the making. What about Jose Aldo? The former featherweight king. The former face of the division. Going down to 135. Who saw this coming? No one. Against Marlon Moraes. Contender at 135. Coming off a title fight. Uriah Faber, Piotr Jan. I said all those already. Jeff Neal, Mike Perry. Rene Aldana against Caitlin Vieira. Omari Akhmedov against Ian Heinish. Matt Brown, Ben Saunders. Chase Hooper against Daniel Tamor. Kara France against Moreno. Vivian Araujo against Jessica I. I mean, the list goes on and on. Oscar Pechota against Puna Soriano. And then, of course, in the co-main event, it's Max Holloway against Alexander the Great Volkanovsky. And he is kind enough to join us on the phone. He's such a big deal. He's on the verge of a championship that he can't even join us on Skype anymore. Only the phone for Alex. He has forgotten where he's came from. Alex, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Sorry about that, mate. What happened? Why can't I see you? I wanted to see your face, oh. your lovely face. Mate, I'm useless with these, these phones, mate. I don't know my, my uh, Skype. I don't know, for some reason, something was detected and it uh, wouldn't let me do it's something. Okay. I had to go my emails and find out how to reset, but we ran out of time. Sorry it's about fine. That. And, and by the way, I just want to let you know, uh, your teammate, Kai Car France, was just on seconds ago via Skype, so he was able to figure it out, but the man fighting for the belt couldn't. I just want to throw that out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my bad. Again, I'm useless <laughs> with these things. But I'll stick to fighting. That's my thing. All right. It's all good. Um, well, thank you for joining us. How are you feeling? Do you feel acclimated? Do you feel, you know, with the time change and all that stuff, you feel settled in Vegas? 
Yeah, yeah, no, well, I adjust it straight away. The time difference, obviously the time difference is a fair bit, but night time, you know what I mean, you can go to sleep reasonably the same sort of time, so my body clock ain't that bad. So I end up staying awake for the, the first day and went to sleep, slept, slept like a champ, and then now I'm already, I'm, I'm already you know, on time with uh, the Vegas time. So we're laughing, feeling real good, sitting here wrapped up in the towel talking to you, mate, feeling oh, great. What a life. Alex, as you know, you know this is the stuff that a, a fighter's dream – is made of right like fighting in las vegas first world title against one of the the best right now in the world this is the kind of stuff that that i i would imagine you have been thinking about for years the fact that you are literally five days away like when you touch down in vegas what are the thoughts the emotions going through your body as you're about to embark on this fight week yeah obviously again you know, this is what we do huh? this is what it's all for for the you know for that that title fight you know being in vegas as well it all just tops that off but you know, again, it's just you know, it's just business. It's just a, another fight. But obviously, I'd be lying if I said you know, fighter Max for the title didn't give me that a little bit more motivation. So, training went really well. I really did push. Um, I'm in a you know, in phenomenal shape to be quite honest. So I'm, mate, I'm ready. I really am. I'm ready. But at the same time, I don't let it, these things don't really get to me. You know, what I mean, I'm taking day by day. You know what I mean? I've got sessions to do. I've got weight to get off. And I've got, uh, I've got the boys to, to hang out with, you know what I mean? Just preparing me for, for the fight. So I'll focus on that. And then come fight time, he's just another job that needs to be done uh, in front of me. Again, nothing but respect to him, but, uh, mate, I, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, Ariel, I'm ready, I'm telling you. And, and I know you fought in, in the U.S. before, but correct me if I'm wrong, first fight in Las Vegas, correct? Yeah, well, it should be second, but then that whole uh, yes. John Jones thing happened and we got pushed to, to yeah, L.A., so... But I mean, you know, I've done most of the fight week here and then we left uh, like a day before the weigh-in. Right. So uh, again, man, look, it's all the same. You go in a hotel, you do your media stuff, you, you know what I mean? You're training, you cut and weight, you're drinking a heap of water, you know what I mean? You're just doing that in different parts of the world. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all the same. Uh, when you saw your, your, your friend and teammate Israel Adesanya win in October, when you saw him realize that dream, and finally get that belt, be the undisputed king of his weight class. What did that do to you as you were preparing for your fight camp? That was, yeah, it was unreal. Actually, it was perfect time. So I was there the, uh, three weeks before before the fight week over there, and I helped uh, with camp, helped the boys with their camp. But it was really early in my camp, so I had I had extra time to yeah, even just evolve. So it was obviously really early in camp. So I was able to you know do kickboxing, the classes, rather than just do conditioning and get ready for the fight. I was able to just really evolve as a fighter there. So it was unreal. and helped the boys out. Nothing but motivation, you know, going to see the boys perform like that. Mate, it got me real keen to get back in there and, you know, and, and get into camp. So I, I got into camp and, you know, it was unreal. It really was. You know, the atmosphere there was incredible. And the atmosphere in the gym the last few weeks was just incredible. You know, it feels the same that it did for, for the boys before their fight. So we, we're coming in. We're coming in strong. We're coming in as a team. Me and Kai are both looking real good. We're ready to ready to steal the show. Were you a little bit sad in the end that you couldn't get that title fight in Australia? I mean, to be honest, no, not really. You know, I, I don't know. It would have been cool, but at the same time, I've got more time to prepare for this fight. I'm on a really big card here in Vegas. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, people this side of the world tuning in. You know, on such a stacked card. And you know what I mean. And you know, again, you know, enough about respect to to Max, but I'm planning on uh, on taking that belt. And you know, I got you know, I'm gonna have this side of the world know exactly who I am, and that's gonna really put me out there. It's really gonna get everyone going fire out. This guy's no joke. This guy's a real deal, and they'll start throwing my name uh, with the big boys. You know what I mean? So it will make some serious money, Ariel. What do you reckon? That's right. Yes, you deserve it. 17 wins in a row. You're coming off a win over Jose Aldo. Speaking of which, seven months ago, you're flying home from that fight. And you have this almost maybe life-threatening uh, disease, the, the the infection, cellulitis. You got to go off on the plane. There you are, and we're showing the video video of you in the uh, in the hotel. Excuse me, in the hospital, and nothing like a hotel. Uh, in I believe Lima, Peru. Does does this experience now fighting for the belt? Does it mean a little more? Are you more appreciative of it because you went through that not that long ago? Um, man, it's just. Yeah, I guess it's just all, all a part of the journey, man. Like, there's so many, I always say this, especially in this sport, there's so many highs and lows. So many high, highs and lows. I've probably said this to you before, like beating Aldo, you know what I mean? You're on absolute high and then 
obviously cut weight, cutting weight before that. So you're on a low, then you win, you're on a high, you party, you're on a high, and then you end up coming home and then you end up getting a bad infection and you're in hospital. You know what I mean? That's just all the way down. Then get news that you're not getting that title. But, man, it just adds to the story. It adds to the, this this sort of, man, like, you know, I, mean, I still get to do what I, I said I was going to do. I said early last year that I want the belt before the year, end of year 2019. And I've said that all this year. I'm going to get the belt before the year's out. And I still get a chance to do that. And that was all just a part of the story. So, you know what I mean? I don't mind. I really, you know what I mean? Again, you know, I just stay positive always. You have to in this game. So it is what it is. I remember. Oh, by the way, that's a nice little uh, shout out to Max there with the yeah. it is what it is uh, pun. Yeah, I don't think gonna go here again. <laughs> yeah um, I remember when Max was first asked about you, Alex, and he said, I don't even know who that person is. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially the message that he put out. And I still can't help but think of that. And I, and I know that he is the consummate pro. And I know he's taking this fight seriously, but is there any part of you that feels like he, you know, he's fought some big names recently, Edgar, Aldo, et cetera. Do you feel like he respects you? Do you feel like he's taking this, this fight seriously? Like he has those other fights? Yeah, I guarantee you he is. I guarantee you he knows this is a, this is a tough fight. Like he, he's a smart man. He's camp. Uh, again, like I believe that there's levels of this game and, and I believe that you know, Max is up there. He knows the game and he knows, why I've been so effective in my last fight. He knows uh, little things that I do and I do well. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're a smart camp, so they know they're in for a tough fight. They know I, I'm a big threat in areas, I guarantee you. And if they don't know, they're going to be in for a rude shock. But I guarantee you, he knows. Earlier on, you're right. You know, he did. I remember him saying that. He, he wasn't too sure about who I was. But that's the thing. Like, that's what I mean by after this fight, everyone's going to know who I am. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are starting to recognize who I am, but... They won't know till I take out the best, you know, and they try and say, blessed is best. And I'm going to show them that, yeah, he was, he was the best for a while, but, you know, now it's my time, you know what I mean? It's, I'm going to go out there and, and do my thing. But that's, that's another thing that I want to touch base on. Uh, a lot of people, yeah, might not, you know, I might not have got that massive push from everyone, you know, because you know, everyone's looking for them big slug fests. You know, I'm a calculated fighter. I ain't going to take stupid risks. I go out there and I get the job done and, and I take him out. But, you know, this fight's going to be a firecracker. But I earned this title. It was earned, not given. That's, that's one thing that people need to understand. I really did earn this opportunity. I'm going to go out there and take it because I yeah. earned it. And yeah. uh, you know what I mean? And then after that, we'll see, we'll see who, who's next. You know what I mean? Like, I, again, whoever earns that shot next, I'm ready to take. I'm ready to take out the best featherweights and I'll claim myself as one of the best featherweights of all time. Again, it's not cockiness. I'm just very, conf yeah, very confident in my abilities and, it's my time. They paying you off for this one, Alex? You getting compensated uh, correctly? Yeah, yeah, no. Obviously, in a title fight, you're getting paid uh, paid better. But I won't be throwing numbers here, mate. I know we get along really well, Ariel. But sorry, mate. <laughs> oh no, I was just wondering. I, I was in, listen. I didn't ask you for numbers. I just wanted to know if they were paying you well. That's all. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, title fight, you get that. Uh, you get a yeah, yeah money, so. But, I mean, you know, after this one, again, you know, this is going to really, really put me in a position where I can be like, hey, you know, I'm the real deal. Give me that money I deserve. Again, I earned it. Yes. And you had the win over Jose Aldo to get this title shot. Do you see the, the photos of him at 135 while, you know, he's cutting down to 135? What do you make of this decision on his part? I, I don't know, man. I, I really don't know. He did, this, I seen the photo, how long ago? It was like four or five weeks ago. Yeah. And it looked bad. It looked really bad, and I was just like, far out. It looked like he was cutting weight already. It looked like he was drawn, and he's already literally been in the sauna making weight. I don't know why he should be so drawn that early. I know he's losing fat, but I don't know why the water looks like it was gone. I don't know what he's eating. I don't know how he's, uh, you know, if he's hydro. I don't know what's going on. But to be honest with you, I hope he's healthy. Um, if he is healthy going into that fight, uh, again, uh, Mariah's is a, a tough fight, but I actually see uh, Aldo winning. A lot of people... Uh, don't realize how, you know, quick and uh, fast and, you know, he's still got it. But again, the game's evolved and I really use that against him. And, you know, people, not everyone understands that, but there's a lot of people that do. Uh, there's still things that Aldo does really well that uh, I think uh, against Morales, you, you will get to see that. So if he's healthy, he'll be dangerous. But I mean, I don't know if he's going to be healthy. Do you know what fascinates me about your title fight on on Saturday, Alex? You're five foot six. He's What's five that? foot eleven, five inches taller. However, you have a longer reach. Your reach two and a half inches longer than his. So how's that going to play out in your mind? You're, you're no stranger to, to fighting taller people, but did you know that your reach was actually longer than his? 
Yeah, so yeah, I knew that. That's what I mean. Like, obviously, oh, mate, you can imagine how many people are like, oh, no, he's got the range, he's got the reach, and I just sit back and laugh. But at the same time, look, obviously he's taller, um, and, you know, reach does go a long way, but you've got to be good, really good at managing distance, you know? So a lot of people get that, that wrong. They, you know, I don't care if uh, Max might look like he has T-Rex arms. He's really good at managing distance. He's really good with even his footwork, and, you know, he's really good at manipulating that distance too. But so am I. I'm very comfortable there. I train with some of the best uh, distance guys in the game, and they're much bigger than uh, Max. So I'm not saying they're going to fight exactly like Max, but, you know what I mean, these guys are going to, you know, the problem that people think that I'm going to have to deal with, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that every day in the gym. So, uh, you know, Max has to do a lot more than just use his re- reach and range of me to, to win this fight. And, uh, again, I've got so many tools. I'm very comfortable out of range. I'm very comfortable in range. Obviously, I'm really good in the pocket. And uh, you've seen me uh, on Aldo really use that, that distance and footwork and stuff like that to just, you know, to get the job done. You know, again, I'm not going to go too far into detail and sure, give sure. away my games too much. But you can, uh, you can see what I've done to Aldo and I completely shut him down. And that wasn't just because he didn't show up. As much as people want to believe that, that ain't what happened. Even if uh, Aldo wants to believe that, again, nothing but respect to him. He's a great champion. But... Uh, I had him feeling like he was stuck in the mud. I had him doing exactly what I wanted him to do, and I capitalized on it. And the sooner people realize that, the sooner they know uh, how much of a real deal I am. I, I, I can't, obviously can't see you right now, but I could sense the, the confidence just like dripping out of your body right now. That It's oozing out of you, and it's making me so excited for this fight. Let us end on this if we can, Alex. Have you allowed yourself at night? You're a family man. Your family means so much. I remember you were on our program. By the way, it's so nice to have you on the show at a normal hour and you not having to wake up at 6 a.m. because you're, you're in Las Vegas. But I remember you joining us from the hospital. Your daughter was having surgery. Have you allowed yourself at night to dream about what it will feel like when you get that belt wrapped around your waist, what that will mean to not only you and your career, but your family as well, do you allow your mind to go there? Yes, I do. I 100%. Like, when I'm away, I, as you, you hit the nail on the head, I'm, I do this for my family. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a family man. I really am. And, uh, you know, I, I chose this sport as my career path. You know, this is how I'm going to feed my family. And I'll say it in, day in, day out. But, you know, I'm away from my family right now to get this job done. So I ain't need to muck around. You know, I'm sitting there thinking that every second of the day I'm doing what needs to be done to, to make sure I perform. I ain't, I ain't playing around. I ain't being silly. While I'm in camp, I ain't having fun doing things. If I'm not with my family, it's strictly business. A job needs to be done, and I want to bring that early Christmas present back to my family, and that's what I'm going to do. I took too much time away from my family uh, to, to, not, to not win, mate. I refuse to lose. Early Christmas presents coming back to my family and, and, and Australia. And uh, everyone back home that supported me, I'm going to prove them right. I'm going to prove all them down as wrong. Can't wait to can't wait to do that December 16th. Or yeah. December 14th here in Vegas. That's right. Um, and I can't wait as well. Two of the best fighters on the planet going toe for toe, toe to toe, I should say. Also, two of the the classiest fighters on the planet as well. And that makes it a little more special, in my opinion. I wish you the best, Alex. Can't wait for the fight. Good luck this week, and uh, hope to see you out there in Las Vegas later in the week. No worries, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, stay tuned, mate. It's going to be a cracker. Can't wait. All right. There he is, Alexander Volkanovsky. And he touched on something that really makes 245 special. All three title fights are all champions going up against the rightful number one contender. There's no funny business. There's no politicking. Usman should have been fighting Covington next. Holloway should have been fighting Volkanovsky next. And Nunes should have been fighting GDR next. And maybe some of you could say, oh, there were sexier matchups. But no, the champions are fighting the rightful number one contender in all three of those title fights. And that is good. That is healthy. That is special, in my opinion. Just the fifth card in UFC history, by the way, where there's three title fights on the same card. 33, 205, 214, 217, and now 245 on Saturday. So we've had... 11 guests on the program. Let's finish with lucky number 12. She had a huge bounce back performance on Saturday in Washington, D.C. She defeated Yana Kunitskaya, the third round of their fight, just 33 seconds into that third round. All the critics, all the haters, all the naysayers, they could take a hike. Aspen Ladd is back. She joins us on the program right now. Aspen, how are you? And congratulations on the win. I'm doing fantastic. And thank you very much. Does it feel like maybe some some weight has been lifted off your shoulders, a bit of pressure after all the stuff that happened in July? Absolutely. I mean, it, it kind of feels like that after every fight. It's a huge relief because every single thing in your life is geared towards what you're about to do and get the fight, um, get there, perform, all that. 
So afterwards, it's relieving regardless, but after that, it's even more so. Um, considering how that fight went back in July and then all the, the talk about the weight cut and everything, w- were you doubting yourself at all going into this one? Did you feel a little more anxious, a little more nervous compared to some of your other fights? You know, Prior to that, of course, you were undefeated. So uh, was there a difference in how you felt going into it on Saturday? No, honestly, this was probably one of the most relaxed ones I've had. I had a lot of notification on this fight. I knew... He's probably over three months ago. I knew it was going to happen when it was going to happen, all that. So I had a lot of preparation time and I felt very ready to go. So I was relaxed. I felt good. Why do you think you were more relaxed than usual considering the stakes? The amount of preparation and just knowing that we were ready and the excitement. I mean, coming off of a loss, coming anytime you're excited to fight, but coming off of a loss, you have something even more so to prove. But there's a level of excitement there to get back and show why you're here and uh, why you deserve to be there. So I was just excited, happy, ready to go. How was this weight cut? This is one of the easier ones that I've had, actually. It was good, healthy. So I've been dieting again for over 12 weeks. Got very, very low and felt good. And was there any consideration to fighting at 145 after what happened in July? Of course, there's always been, though, but it's like um, a perfect fight kind of thing. If the right fight comes up at 45, I'm completely game to take it, but I am a 35er, so it was definitely have to clear that CSAC thing up because I want to be able to fight in this weight class but have the opportunity to fight at 45 if I wish to as well, not just because I have to. Okay, and so now considering how this one went, is it safe to assume that you are going to stick around? at 135 for the foreseeable future? Yes, it's the weight class where you have more opportunity, I believe, at this moment. There's not really too much of a 145 weight class. But at the same time, the perfect fight, short notice fight, whatever, I would be glad to take one at 45 eventually. Okay. And um, by the way, do you mind just tilting up the camera a little bit? We see like sort of half your face at time. There we go. We want to see the, the cool hair. You kept the braids in. You didn't take them out yet. I love them. They're awesome. Yes, they are. How long do you usually keep the braids in after your fight? Um, it depends. Sometimes only a day, sometimes a couple. Depends on how long I could take it. I kind of a, a sissy head as far as tenderness kind of thing. Okay. Um, and so that fight was so interesting because first two rounds, you know, go as they go. And then there's that moment in between the second and third where, you know, a, a fire is lit under you. And then you come out like, you know, a completely different fight, bat out of the hell, and you drop her early, and then you eventually finish her in that third round. What was going through your mind in the first and second? Why did it seem like your coaches were not happy with you in those first two rounds, maybe not pulling the trigger as aggressive as they wanted? It seemed like going into that third, they really felt like they had to kind of, you know, fire you up, get you excited. Why, why do you think that happened in the first and second round? Um, absolutely. I think it's just any fight going into the third round, it's very likely you're about to come up on a decision. And if you leave that to the judges, it doesn't matter. You can have something where it might not necessarily go that way, whether you think you won or you didn't. So there's always a sense of urgency when you're coming into the third and last round. That's the last time you have to prove yourself, basically. So their urgency was, who knows, if there are a couple of close rounds, you better get out there and really put an exclamation mark on this one. And I got uh, chewed out pretty good and... Went out and listened. Yeah, and, and you got chewed out by your coach, Jim West, who uh, you know was, was really aggressive as far as telling you what he wanted to see out of you. And it, and it wasn't maybe the most technical advice, but it seemed like the right kind of advice for that moment. Does he usually do that? That clip has now gone viral somewhat. Does he usually speak to you like that in between rounds? Um, usually it's a little bit more technical than that, but in the same, at the same time, that one was a little more urgent. Third round uh, coming into the end. He really wanted to make sure uh, we do everything that we possibly could to finish the fight and uh, make sure we weren't going to leave it in the hands of the judges. So that was just more get on it as opposed to technical advice. Right. And and does he usually speak in that kind of tone? Or did you realize with the tone and the different kind of advice that, you know, it, it was time to get going? There's certainly a lot of urgency as far as uh, that particular clip goes. That one had more than... Uh, more than the usual. Yeah. It wasn't exactly normal, but it wasn't out of place for fight night. That's that's tense time. 
Okay. Are are you are you like reacting to this in your mind? Like, oh man, he's he's not too happy right now. I get like, did you do you remember having an internal dialogue as you get up off the stool and they're about to start the third round? Are you telling yourself like I need to get going right now? Or do you remember talking to yourself? Oh yeah, it's like, oh shoot, if they're this this word, like you gotta go, you gotta go now. Who knows what's happened with the other two rounds and who knows with the judging. I mean, that night there's two draws for crying out loud with which is not really, it's not normal. Yeah. And you never know what judges peer. I felt like I was doing fairly well, but I, even I don't know, I was like, this is going to decision. I want to make sure I'm doing everything that I can. Absolutely everything to make sure it's not going to go the other way, you know? Mm -hmm. But when there's that kind of level of urgency, it's like, oh gosh, I better, I got to do something now. Who do you want next? (laughs) Everybody asks that. Everybody's at a dance partner right now, and then obviously we got the title fight this weekend, which I will be uh, watching and enjoying from the couch somewhere. And we'll see. We'll see. After Christmas, after everything, we'll see what the UFC wants to do with me. Do you think Jermaine has a shot against Amanda this weekend? I do. I think a lot of people discredit her or don't really con- consider or remember exactly who she is and how good she is at what she does. She is an expert craftsman, basically, in, uh, in her striking and everything. She's very good, very skilled, and, they, well, they both are. So it'll be, it'll be a good fight. But I don't think you should ever count anybody out, especially her. Right, and it's a great story, especially considering she was the 145 champion and had to give up the title, and now she's getting another crack against someone she lost. So it's a wonderful story, and, and I think that you're certainly in the mix. Um, maybe one or two fights, and you're right back in that spot. And it seems it's it seems interesting because like this time last year, I feel like a lot of people were pointing to you as maybe being a champion by the end of this year. When you look back at this past year, and there was that talk of you fighting maybe Holly Holm and all the stuff that happened at the beginning. When you look back at 2019, what are the the feelings that you have about this past year? Does it feel like you didn't accomplish your goals? Are you content with it? How do you feel about it? I am extremely happy with it. My only goal at the beginning of the year, honestly, was to fight three or four times. Fought three times. Uh, headlined a card for the first time ever. Didn't go my way. Came back from it. Had an excellent showing this past weekend. So, I mean, there's ups and downs. I learned some stuff. It was a successful year from my point of view. Okay. I like that approach. And even after the first loss, you weren't down too much? Did you need some time away? Or did you get right back on the horse? Not at all. I tried to keep take it a very... I don't want to be a head case, for example, and I don't need to be. You'll win some, you'll lose some. This is a tough sport. We're all at the top of our game. You get to the UFC, it's hard. Staying there is harder. And the better you do, the better the competition. So it's just part of it. If you can't take a loss and come back and perform, that really doesn't say too much about your mental state and ability to keep going. Mm. Things happen. You got to bounce back and come back and do better. I respect it. In fact, I think that uh, on our list we did, I don't know if you saw this, uh, we had a uh, top 25, under 25 fighters in the sport right now. You clocked in at number four. I have a feeling if we would have done that before the GDR fight, uh, you might have been number one, so maybe something to strive for. But did you know that? Did you know that you were number four on our list? I didn't, actually. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So it's uh, it's been a successful year, I think, despite all the drama and all the, the 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 weight stuff and the commission stuff and all that. You bounce back, you end the year on a high note and uh, on a very fun note as well. That was a great finish on Saturday. Congratulations on the win, Aspen. Happy for you and uh, happy holidays. And we'll hopefully see you back in there early next year. Awesome. Thank you for having me on, and I appreciate it. It is a pleasure as always. There she is, Aspen Ladd, still a top contender at 135. Of course, there was a lot of talk after the the loss to GDR back in July. Should she move up to 145? Uh, you know, she she was undefeated going into that fight. 135 loses the fight in very quick fashion. Has trouble making weight. Difficult scene to watch unfold. But here she is. Takes some time off. Comes back. Makes the weight pretty darn well. It seemed 136. And then has a great victory over Yana Kunitskaya, a former uh, title contender and a uh, Invicta champ as well. So good stuff for Aspen. Great night in D.C. for a very good cause. 
some other notable performances that I didn't touch on. Rob Font with a nice win over Ricky Simone. Tim Means and Tiago Alves, both on the final fight of their contract. Uh, Means gets the win. Is this the end for Tiago Alves? We shall see one of the uh, the legends of the game. Joe Selecki with the win over Matt Wyman. Matt Wyman, um, maybe this is the end for him. He was maybe going to be on the show, but he's always elusive and in the end was not on the show today. And uh, Selecki looked really good. And of course, Bryce Mitchell with the twister. Just the second in UFC history. All right. That's it. Are we doing the best of before or after Corporate Jake? All right. Before the show, they were like, huh, 12 guests. No way you're going to finish this on time. I was like, oh, yeah? How about I finish it at 414 with one minute to spare, all right? <laughs> you're not going to make it. Oh, no one's going to show up. People are going to be late, this, that, and the other. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. What a fun day it has been. An old school show, if you will. And by the way, this Friday, December 13th, Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club at the Link Promenade. The prestigious NWO title on the line. Four contestants, Kiesa, Joanna, Derek Lewis, Dominic Reyes, all vying for that trivia belt. Thank you to Andrew Davis, by the way, for the questions. He is the man. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there on Friday night. For now, though, we shall say goodbye. <clears throat> Thank you very much to Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Congrats to him. Thank you very much to Amanda Nunes. Good luck to her. Thank you very much to Liz Carmouche. Good luck to her. Thank you very much to Bryce Mitchell. Congrats to him. Thank you very much to Paul Felder. Good luck to him. February 22nd. Thank you very much to Terrence Crawford. Good luck to him this Saturday. Thank you very much, Francis Nganu. Thank you very much, Stefan Struve. And of course, thank you very much to Diego Sanchez, Kaikar France. Good luck to Alex Volkanovsky. And thank you very much to Aspen Ladd. Back next week, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here. I want to do, keep doing things nobody see before, you know? I want to be the first one to defend the two belts. Do you think it's unfair to distinguish between male and female? Should you just be considered one of the best fighters, period, of all time? I ask you that. You're asking me? I want to know what you think. <laughs> yes. And we're on the drive back, about to go get food, and my management calls. And I'm like, well, that can't be a good thing if I'm in the car. Coach said cook them all the way to the bone. And I cooked them all the way to the bone. Me fell right off that bone. That was touching right there. That was a little bit of a, that was more aggressive than the stare down. How did you feel about that? You've got to resort to that. What's going on in your head? Would you ever do MMA? Uh, I don't, I don't know, man. They don't pay enough. Will you try to counter his, his antics? If he wants to have a cartwheel off, we'll have a cartwheel off. Like, <laughs> like, like, I've been working on my backflips. I got a somersault. You know, I could do a 360. <laughs> I go out there and I get the job done and, and I take him out. But, you know, this fight's going to be a firecracker. But I earned this title. It was earned, not given. That's that's one thing that people need to understand. At least you have someone who wants to fight you openly, right? Jarzinho. He told us March, April, though, he wants to return. Is that a little too late for you? Do I have a choice? <laughs> do they give me something? No. I would love to have legend Mike Tyson in the huh. corner. If you ain't doing anything, February 15th, OG Diego Sanchez needs a cornerman. You know how hard I'll hit Floyd Mayweather? How hard? I'll hit Floyd hard. He'll wake up and be able to read a book. <laughs>